Chapter 7 Concerning Marriage 7 colon 1-7 God has established marriage. It is better to marry than to burn. 7 colon 8-24 Marriage between believers and unbelievers. 7 colon 25-40 Advice to the unmarried and their parents. Having reproved and corrected the Corinthians concerning several issues, Paul now starts answering their questions beginning with marriage. Christians are to marry in the Lord. Some were saved after marriage. What should they do? Should they leave an unsaved spouse? What if the unsaved partner wants to end the marriage? Paul says, stay where you are and use every opportunity to win the lost mate. Paul uses the word called nine times in this chapter. Paul says, stay where you are. Remain in the marriage you are in. Remain in the physical condition that you are in. Remain in the job or socioeconomic place that you are in unless you can better your situation. Then Paul addressed the unmarried. The theme of the chapter is marriage and staying where you are. I am a retired registered nurse, RN, and certified nurse midwife, CNM, who helped deliver babies for 35 years in hospitals, birth centers, and homes. I also have a degree in clinical psychology. During my last 23 years as a midwife, I was the owner and operator of Christian Midwife Home Birth Service, and I taught women to love their husbands and children. I have been saved and studying the Bible for almost 30 years. But it was not until I came to rightly divide the word of truth that I learned about true liberty, deep joy, and real clarity of God's word. I want everyone to have this freedom. Please do not be surprised if some of the things I say as we study this chapter on marriage are frank, candid, and personal regarding marriage and intimate relations because Paul was. It is wonderful how modest yet clear the language is in the King James Bible, so I will be also. Paul explained the nation of Israel's fall in Romans 9 to 11. Israel was a vessel of honor, but now she is a vessel of dishonor. After our rapture, God will reshape Israel into a vessel of honor again using Israel's believing remnant, Peter's group. I go into detail on this issue in my book Romans, a concise commentary, especially in chapter 9 on page 69 or C and listen to my teaching on these chapters on YouTube. How did God demonstrate to the world that his nation was preferred in the past? He was with them, he made them different by making promises and covenants with them, and he gave them his written law through Moses. God gave them, one, the token of circumcision as a sign of the Abrahamic covenant that he would be their God and they would be his people forever, and two, the land of Canaan. But today, there is no reason for anyone to be circumcised other than the Jews because it was an everlasting covenant and sign for them. God made all the covenants with Israel and not with the body of Christ. God is not dealing with the nation of Israel today, but is forming the body of Christ in the dispensation of grace. The body of Christ is not spiritual Israel. Both replacement theology and covenant theology are false doctrines. Today, God is forming a new creature, Gal. 6.15, the one new man, F. 2.15, made up of both individual Jews and Gentiles, Gal. 3.28, the middle wall of partition has been broken down and is not in effect. Today, there is no difference or distinction in the body of Christ between Jews and Gentiles. Israel is an apostasy, lo ami, not my people, and not God's preferred nation. We are called mid-Acts dispensationalists, mad, although I prefer just to be known as a Christian Bible believer. Mid-Acts means we believe that God says that the body of Christ began with Christ's heavenly ministry through Paul when he saved him on the road to Damascus in Acts 9. Christ revealed his plan to populate the heavenly places with a particular group of people progressively to Paul. 7 colon 1 Two one reason why Paul remained celibate was so that he might devote himself completely to the service of Christ. However, marriage can help the husband and wife avoid fornication because their intimate needs are filled. Other reasons for companionship and affection. 
To prevent immorality, part of the duty of a husband and a wife is to give themselves to intimate relations with one another. 7 colon 3, for the husband's body belongs to the wife and the wife's body to the husband. We are not to practice self-gratification, but gratification within the confines of marriage. Paul clearly teaches monogamy between one husband and one wife. Furthermore, it was important for husbands to be satisfied at home and not run up to the temple of Aphrodite on top of the mountain overlooking the city of Corinth with its thousand temple prostitutes. Benevolence means to do good, bring joy. 7 colon 5 Withholding intimate relations is a type of defrauding of the spouse unless done by mutual consent for a short time of prayer and fasting. But then come together again so that Satan cannot tempt either one from seeking satisfaction elsewhere. Incontinence means unable to contain themselves. 7 colon 6 7 Paul says, I am telling you this by permission from Christ, not by his commandment. Paul wishes that everyone had the gift of celibacy. Paul may have been married at one time since he was probably a member of the Sanhedrin. He cast his vote against the believers in the little flock, Acts 26 verse 10, and marriage was a requirement for that office. But he was now celibate serving the Lord. Paul says I have the gift of celibacy, but I know that everyone has different gifts. 7 colon 8 dash 11 if someone has the desire for intimate relations and a life partner let them marry that is not sinning the lord told paul that a wife should not depart from her husband if she leaves for a while she should not marry another but may go back and reconcile with her husband paul is permitting not commanding separation a husband is not to put away his wife we are not under the law but under grace rom 614, 7 14-16 Husbands and wives of unbelievers should remain with unsaved partners and do their best to win them to Christ. We are to live in peace with them. I heard a pastor say that he led his wife to the Lord because he did not presume that she was saved even though she was in the church choir and did many other Christian things. We have to ask our spouses what they are trusting in to get them into heaven. If it is not in Christ alone, then they are not saved. The other spouse and their children are physically sanctified by the believer, so in the marriage bed the believer is not joined to a harlot. 6.16 But if the unbeliever leaves, then through abandonment the marriage relationship is broken and the partner has a chance for divorce and remarriage. 7.17-19 Remain in the physical condition you are in when you are saved. God is not commanding physical circumcision in this dispensation, but faith in Christ. Some teach that this verse refers to the little flock and the body of Christ believers, but I believe Paul is talking about physical circumcision. Circumcision is nothing today because the crosswork of Christ is everything, gal. 2 colon 3, 5 colon 1 dash 6. We contributed nothing to our salvation except the sin that made it necessary. As Jonathan Edwards said, there is no distinction in the body of Christ among believers, between Jews and Gentiles we are all one in Christ, Gal. 3.28 I believe that Paul is saying that just like the color of someone's skin does not matter in marriage neither does their religious background matter. All that matters is that they have trusted in Christ for their salvation. We are made of one blood, Acts 17 verse 26. In Israel's program, circumcision mattered, Gen 17. God was mad with Moses for not having his son circumcised, Exodus 4 verse 25. Today, Israel is not the preferred nation. The middle wall of partition is down, F. 214, Israel of today is an apostasy not believing in their Messiah. After the rapture, God will resume his dealings with Israel. Today, both Jews and Gentiles are saved by believing Paul's gospel, 1 Cor. 15 colon 3, 4. Today to be water baptized or physically circumcised is a sign of unbelief in what God is doing. Our baptism and circumcision are both spiritual and take place the moment we believe, 1 Cor. 12 13, Colossians 2 verses 9 to 15. Since we can't feel this, we accept it by faith in what the Bible says.
When we identify with Christ's death and resurrection through faith, God performed an operation without hands and circumcised or cut the connection between our soul and our body, flesh, freeing us from the power of our flesh. The fleshly nature was rendered dead and powerless, so if the believer sins now he does so by choice. God made us spiritually alive with Christ forgiving us of all our trespasses. He blotted out all the sins that we had committed, all the wrong things that we had done against God. He took them out of the way and nailed them to the cross. Asterisk notice that Christ, in whom the Godhead dwells bodily spoiled, plundered or took us back from Satan and his devils. Jesus was victorious and triumphed over Satan. He openly shamed him and his cohorts with one gigantic costly sacrifice of obedience to the Father demonstrating the manifold wisdom of God. Jews and Gentiles can marry in the Lord in this age, Colossians 3 verse 11. Furthermore, there are no health reasons for being circumcised according to the American College of Pediatrics. Remember in many countries in Europe none of the men are circumcised, except the Jews, and they do not have an increased health problem because of that. Sexual contact and uncleanliness are what causes sexually transmitted disease. In fact, uncircumcision may have a protective purpose and assist with increased sensitivity. Remember that Adam was made perfectly to live forever, and he had foreskin. The circumcision of the Jews involves just the tip of the foreskin and not all of it, like in America. Circumcision was a token of the covenant between God and his nation, Genesis 17 verse 11. It was a sign for Israel to trust in God, not their flesh, like Abraham did when he had Ishmael. Even for Israel, they were to have a circumcision of the heart. But we are not under the law, but under grace. Christ has done everything to save us, so whether a man is circumcised or not, does not matter. We obey the commandments Christ gave us through Paul and to be circumcised was not one of them, 1437. Circumcision was one the covenants that belonged to Israel, wrong. 9 colon 4. 7 colon 20 23 believers are to stay where they are when they were saved as far as their socioeconomic workplace goes. But if you have an opportunity to improve your workplace, take it. Servants are free in Christ, and free men are his servants. If you are a slave and have an opportunity to be free, take it. Servants can marry others in the Lord. There are no socioeconomic prohibitions in marriage. Paul says bought with a price for the second time, 620, so serve God where you are. 7 colon 24 dash 27 virgins, male or female, Paul says let a man remain a virgin, Revelation 14 verse 4. The present distress was the sufferings during the foundation of the body of Christ. If you are married, stay that way. If you are unmarried, stay that way. 728 If a virgin marries, they have not sinned. But for the sake of the female, Paul says she will have trouble in the flesh. Marriage brings responsibilities. Women have so much work to do in the home. No human is able to meet another human's need completely. Humans are imperfect, so we both need to be patient with each other. It is nice to have a companion in this life. Only God can meet our every need. The woman was to be a core gent with Adam, Gen 1 colon 26 28, but because Eve sinned, the husband rules over the wife. Christ's righteousness upon salvation is greater than the sin of Adam and Eve, wrong. 5. There is still a hierarchy between equals as we will learn in chapter 11. In the kingdom, Christ will rule with his bride, Israel's believers. 7 colon 29 dash 31 time is short because our lifetimes are short, we do not know when we will be raptured, and this world is passing away and will be replaced, 2 Peter 3 verse 7 13. Serve God as if you did not have a wife. It is time for those who weep because of widowhood or abandonment to serve God as if they had no sorrow. Those who rejoice, newlyweds, to work as if they did not. Businessmen, do not let your business take you away from working for the Lord. Do not let your possessions possess you. This world is a very vain, empty, fashion show, 
PSA 90 colon 10 all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players they have their exits and their entrances and one man in his time plays many parts his acts being seven ages William Shakespeare 7 colon 32 34 but be not full of care if you are unmarried you will care for the things that belong to the Lord how we can please him but the married care for the things of the world how they can please their spouse 735 36 in that culture it was customary for the father to decide who the daughter should marry paul speaks for our best interest paul does not want us to feel trapped he just says that it is best to stay single so we can serve the lord without distraction jesus said something similar for there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake he that is able to receive it let him receive it matt 1912 if a father wants his daughter to marry and she has come of age he can go and find her a husband and let them marry which is not a sin 737 38 so the father that gives his virgin in marriage does well but the father that decided in his heart to be responsible for and to provide for his virgin daughter so she can remain single and serve the lord does better 739 40 marriage is for life the wife should stay married till death do you part if her husband dies she is free to marry whom she wants but only to a believer to core 6 colon 14 18 Paul says he has the Spirit of God as he writes and that the widow will be happier if she stays single. We may marry whom we will only in the Lord, 739. Regarding marriage and divorce, we are under grace. If there is physical abuse in the marriage or dangerous activity like drug and alcohol abuse or sexual infidelity that may lead to deadly venereal disease like AIDS, then the spouse should be able to exit the marriage for their own safety. Christ taught that adultery was grounds for divorce, Matt. 19,7-9, even God divorced Israel for a season because of her spiritual adultery, Je. 3,8, ISA. 50 colon 1. But God did not have relations with another during that time but remained faithful to his people. Rev 19 colon 7, 21 colon 9 14. 7 colon 1. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. One reason why Paul remained celibate was so that he might devote himself completely to the service of Christ. 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. However, marriage can help the husband and wife avoid fornication because their intimate needs are filled. Other reasons for marriage are companionship and affection and to prevent immorality. Part of the duty of a husband and a wife is to give themselves to intimate relations with one another. 3. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, doing good, bringing joy, and pleasure, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. For the wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. The husband's body belongs to the wife and the wife's body to the husband. We are not to practice self-gratification, but gratification within the confines of marriage. Paul clearly teaches monogamy between one husband and one wife. Furthermore, it was important for husbands to be satisfied at home and not run up to the temple of Aphrodite on top of the mountain overlooking the city of Corinth with its thousand temple prostitutes. Five defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Withholding intimate relations is a type of defrauding of the spouse unless done by mutual consent for a short time of prayer and fasting. But then come together again so that Satan cannot tempt either one from seeking satisfaction elsewhere. Incontinence means unable to contain themselves. 6. But I speak this by permission, and not of commandment. Paul says I am telling you this by permission from Christ, not by commandment. 
Seven, for I would that all men were even as I myself. But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner, and another after that. Paul wishes that everyone had the gift of celibacy. Paul may have been married at one time since he was probably a member of the Sanhedrin. He cast his vote against the believers in the little flock in Acts 26 verse 10, and marriage was a requirement for that office. But he was now celibate and serving the Lord. Paul says, I have the gift of celibacy, but I know that everyone has different gifts. 8. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I and 9. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. 10. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. 11. But and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. If someone has the desire for intimate relations and a life partner, let them marry that is not sinning. The Lord told Paul that a wife should not depart from her husband. If she leaves for a while, she should not marry another but may go back and reconcile with her husband. Paul is permitting not commanding separation. A husband is not to put away his wife. We are not under the law but under grace. Rom. 614 12. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord, if any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. 13. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else. Were your children unclean, but now are they holy. 15. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. 16. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Husbands and wives of unbelievers should remain with unsaved partners and do their best to win them to Christ. We are to live in peace with them. I heard a pastor say that he led his wife to the Lord because he did not presume that she was saved even though she was in the church choir and did many other Christian things. We have to ask our spouses what they are trusting in to get them into heaven. If it is not in Christ alone, then they are not saved. The other spouse and their children are physically sanctified by the believer so in the marriage bed the believer is not joined to a harlot. 6.16 but if the unbeliever leaves then through abandonment the marriage relationship is broken and the partner has a chance for divorce and remarriage. 17. But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called everyone, so let him walk. And so, ordain I in all churches. 18. Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Remain in the physical condition you are in when you are saved. Some teach that this verse refers to the little flock and the body of Christ believers, but I believe Paul is talking about physical circumcision. Circumcision is nothing today because the crosswork of Christ is everything, gal. 2 colon 3, 5 colon 1 dash 6. We contributed nothing to our salvation except the sin that made it necessary as Jonathan Edwards said. There is no distinction in the body of Christ among believers, between Jews and Gentiles we are all one in Christ, Gal. 3.28 I believe that Paul is saying that just like the color of someone's skin does not matter in marriage neither does their religious background matter. All that matters is that they have trusted in Christ for their salvation. We are made of one blood, Acts 17 verse 26. In Israel's program circumcision mattered, Gen 17. God was mad with Moses for not having his son circumcised, Exodus 4 verse 25. Today, Israel is not the preferred nation, the middle wall of partition is down, F. 214, Israel of today is an apostasy not believing in their Messiah. After the rapture God will resume his dealings with Israel. Today, 
both Jews and Gentiles are saved by believing Paul's gospel, 1 Cor. 15 colon 3, 4. Today to be water baptized or physically circumcised is a sign of unbelief in what God is doing. Our baptism and circumcision are both spiritual and take place the moment we believe, 1 Cor. 12 13, Colossians 2 verses 9 to 15. Since we can't feel this, we accept it by faith in what the Bible says. When we identify with Christ's death and resurrection through faith God, performed an operation without hands and circumcised or cut the connection between our soul and our body, flesh, freeing us from the power of our flesh. The fleshly nature was rendered dead and powerless, so if the believer sins now he does so by choice. God made us spiritually alive with Christ forgiving us of all our trespasses. He blotted out all the sins that we had committed, all the wrong things that we had done against God. He took them out of the way and nailed them to the cross. Asterisk notice that Christ, in whom the Godhead dwells bodily spoiled, plundered or took us back from Satan and his devils. Jesus was victorious and triumphed over Satan. He openly shamed him and his cohorts with one gigantic costly sacrifice of obedience to the Father demonstrating the manifold wisdom of God. Jews and Gentiles can marry in the Lord in this age, Colossians 3 verse 11. Furthermore, there are no health reasons for being circumcised according to the American College of Pediatrics. Remember in many countries in Europe none of the men are circumcised, except the Jews, and they do not have an increased health problem because of that. Sexual contact and uncleanliness are what causes sexually transmitted disease. In fact, uncircumcision may have a protective purpose and assist with increased sensitivity. Remember that Adam was made perfectly to live forever, and he had foreskin. The circumcision of the Jews involves just the tip of the foreskin and not all of it, like in America. Circumcision was a token of the covenant between God and his nation, Genesis 17 verse 11. It was a sign for Israel to trust in God, not their flesh, like Abraham did when he had Ishmael. Even for Israel, they were to have a circumcision of the heart. But we are not under the law, but under grace. 19. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. Christ has done everything to save us, so whether a man is circumcised or not, does not matter. We obey the commandments Christ gave us through Paul and to be circumcised was not one of them, 1437. Circumcision was one the covenants that belonged to Israel, Rom. 9 colon 4. 20. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. 21. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it, but if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. 22. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's freeman, likewise, also he that is called, being free, is Christ's servant. Believers are to stay where they are when they were saved as far as their socioeconomic workplace goes. But if you have an opportunity to improve your workplace, take it. Servants are free in Christ, and free men are his servants. If you are a slave and have an opportunity to be free, take it. Servants can marry others in the Lord. There are no socioeconomic prohibitions in marriage. 23 Ye are bought with a price, be not ye the servants of men. Paul says bought with a price for the second time, 620, so serve God. 24 Brethren, let every man, wherein he is called, therein abide with God. 25 Now concerning virgins I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment, as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. 26 I suppose therefore that this is good for the present distress, I say, that it is good for a man so to be. 27 Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. Concerning virgins, male or female, Paul says let a man remain a virgin, Revelation 14 verse 4. The present distress was the sufferings during the foundation of the body of Christ. 
If you are married, stay that way. If you are unmarried, stay that way. 28. But and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned, and if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. If a virgin marries, they have not sinned. But for the sake of the female, Paul says she will have trouble in the flesh. Marriage brings responsibilities. Women have so much work to do in the home. No human is able to meet another human's need completely. Humans are imperfect, so we both need to be patient with each other. It is nice to have a companion in this life. Only God can meet our every need. The woman was to be a corgent with Adam, Gen 1 colon 26 28, but because he sinned, the husband rules over the wife. Christ's righteousness upon salvation is greater than the sin of Adam and Eve, Rom. 5. There is still a hierarchy between equals as we will learn in chapter 11. In the kingdom, Christ will rule with his bride, Israel's believers. 29. But this I say, brethren, the time is short, it remaineth, that both they that have wives be as though they had none, 30. And they that weep, as though they wept not, and they that rejoice, as though they rejoiced not, and they that buy, as though they possessed not, 31. And they that use this world, as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. Time is short because our lifetimes are short, we do not know when we will be raptured, and this world is passing away and will be replaced, 2 Peter 3 verses 7 to 13. Serve God as if you did not have a wife. It is time for those who weep because of widowhood or abandonment to serve God as if they had no sorrow. Those who rejoice, newlyweds, to work as if they did not. Businessmen, do not let your business take you away from working for the Lord. Do not let your possessions possess you. This world is a very vain, empty, fashion show. PSA. 90 colon 10. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players, they have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages William Shakespeare. 32 But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. 33 But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. 34 There is difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. But be not full of care. If you are unmarried, you will care for the things that belong to the Lord, how we can please him. But the married care for the things of the world, how they can please their spouse. 35. And this I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, and that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. 36. But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age, and need so require, let him do what he will, he sinneth not, let them marry. In that culture it was customary for the father to decide who the daughter should marry. Paul speaks for our best interest. Paul does not want us to feel trapped. He just says that it is best to stay single so we can serve the Lord without distraction. Jesus said something similar, for there are some eunuchs, which were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs, which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs, which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it, Matt. 19.12 If a father wants his daughter to marry and she has come of age, he can go and find her a husband and let them marry which is not a sin. 37 Nevertheless he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but hath power over his own will, and hath so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin, doeth well. 38 So then he that giveth her in marriage doeth well, but he that giveth her not in marriage doeth better. So, the father that gives his virgin in marriage does well, but the father that decided in his heart to be responsible for and to provide for his virgin daughter so she can remain single and serve the Lord does better. 39 The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, 
she is at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the Lord. 40. But she is happier if she so abide after my judgment, and I think also that I have the Spirit of God. Marriage is for life. The wife should stay married till death do you part. If her husband dies, she is free to marry whom she wants, but only to a believer, to core. 6 14 18. Paul says he has the Spirit of God as he writes and that the widow will be happier if she stays single. We may marry whom we will only in the Lord. Regarding marriage and divorce, we are under grace. If there is physical abuse in the marriage or dangerous activity like drug and alcohol abuse or sexual infidelity, which may lead to deadly venereal disease like AIDS, then the spouse should be able to exit the marriage for their own safety. Christ taught that adultery was grounds for divorce, Matt. 19 colon 7. 9. Even God divorced Israel for a season because of spiritual adultery, Ja. 3 colon 8, ISA. 50 colon 1. But God did not have relations with another during that time but remained faithful to his people, Rev 19 colon 7, 21 colon 9 dash 14. Chapter 8. The weaker brother, idols, and our liberty. 8 colon 1 dash 13 meat offered to idols, Christ our example, and the weaker brother. Chapters 8 dash 11 colon 1 deal with the question of meat, food, offered to idols. In chapter 8 Paul uses the example of Christ. Christ sacrificed himself for us, he died for us. 811 we must be motivated by love and not use our knowledge to stumble a weaker brother. In chapter 9, Paul will use himself as an example of what to do, and in chapter 10, he will use Israel as an example of what not to do. Then he says, follow me as I follow Christ, 11 colon 1. We will find out that Paul is speaking about a specific type of knowledge in chapter 8. Before we get into our study, let me just demonstrate how easy it is to help others to understand the Bible. If we pinch together Paul's letters Romans to Philemon, less than 7% of the Bible, then we can say that if we cut these out of the Bible, we have removed the body of Christ from the Bible. Most of the Bible is written to and about the nation of Israel. On the left and right sides of Paul's letters is prophecy, while Paul's letters are about the mystery. The Bible is laid out like this. Israel, body of Christ, Israel. Earth, heaven, earth. Past, present, future. Time past, but now, ages to come. Prophecy, mystery, prophecy. Earth kingdom believers, heaven kingdom believers, earth kingdom believers. Old covenant, law, no covenant, new covenant, law. Romans 11 is the key to understanding that we are living in the dispensation of grace, which is holding back God's wrath, the tribulation. We are living in the time of Israel's national blindness, Rom. 11.25, God has interrupted prophecy and inserted the mystery which Christ revealed to us through his spokesman, Paul. It is important to understand that the Gentiles have been grafted into Israel's blessings, not the body of Christ. Romans 11 verses 11 and 13, 17. Gentiles mean nations. Today, people of all nations have an opportunity, even Jews, to trust in what Christ has done and be saved. Only those who believe the gospel, good news, that is clearly stated in 1 COR. 15 colon 3, for become members of the body of Christ. The body of Christ is totally separate from Israel and has nothing to do with Israel. Only the body of Christ members will be raptured and spend eternity with Christ in heaven. 8 colon 1 Paul is answering their questions regarding meat, food, offered to idols. While it is true that knowledge can puff us up, Paul does not mean that we should not. Do all we can to know God and what he says through his word. This is why he prays for the Ephesians and Colossians that they may have knowledge. F. 117, Colossians 1 verses 9 and 10. Paul's goal was knowledge of Jesus, philosophy. 310, 2 Cor. 10 colon 5, 
But knowledge must be balanced by charity, love and action, which builds up. How often does our flesh want to be exalted? All the time. Therefore, we must as Paul says, I die daily, 1531. It is not about me or us, it is about Christ. We must die to ourselves and live unto Christ. It is not I, but Christ, Gal. 220. We reverence the Godhead, are in awe of his word and are grateful that he graciously gives us eternal life and not what we deserve. We must do all for the glory of God. Our motive should always be to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ and bless the body of Christ. It takes only one millisecond to go from walking in the spirit to living in the flesh that is why Paul says, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, 927. But in our liberty, we must be careful not to stumble the weaker. Brother. In the context, this knowledge is the understanding that eating meat offered to idols does not matter. What matters is what Christ has done. But we must not use. Our liberty to stumble someone whose conscience may think it is wrong to eat that meat. These chapters, 8 to 10, address the weaker brother principle found in Romans chapter 14 to 15 colon 3. I used to be a weaker brother before I learned how to rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Tim, 2.15. At that time, I did not eat my favorite part of my pizza, the sausage, because I was a mixer and thought the Jewish dietary laws somehow pertained to me. I mixed Peter and Paul, law and grace, the things that belong to Israel with those of the body of Christ because I thought that the church, the body of Christ, began in Acts 2. I had not yet learned that the body of Christ began in Acts 9. I did not know that there was more than one church in the Bible. The Church in the Wilderness, Acts 7 verse 38, the Messianic Judaism Church in Matthew, 16 colon 16 dash 18, Psalm 22 verse 22, Heb, 2 12, and also the Body of Christ, F, 122, 23. In Acts 10 verse 15, God showed Peter that he was no longer making the distinction between clean and unclean animals or people, the clean represented the Jews and the unclean the Gentiles. What happened? Why the change? Peter did not understand why until Paul told him in Acts 15 and Galatians 2. God has postponed his prophetic dealings with the nation of Israel because they rejected their Messiah for the third time in Acts 7 with the stoning of the Holy Ghost filled Stephen. Israel committed the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost and are in apostasy. 8 colon 2 We can think we know something when we really just have a very limited concept of how things are, compared to God. For one thing, Paul had not received the full revelation of the mystery yet, 1 Cor. 13 12 And for another thing every one of us must be careful not to fall into the temptation of a wrong motive, Gal. 6 colon 1 dash 5 8 colon 3 Loving God for what he has done is the knowledge that counts. God sees our hearts and knows those who belong to him. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. 2 Timothy 2 verse 19 the Bible says that the Lord knows us and has sealed us unto the day of redemption, F. 430, a sealed person is a saved person. We cannot tell who is saved by looking at them. So how can we know? By their testimony. By whom and what they say they are trusting in for their salvation. 8 colon 4 There is only one God. Since there is no power in an idol, the meat is not affected in any way. 8 colon 5 There were many temples for the Greek gods in Corinth, like the Temple of Apollos. These false gods were merely called gods, they were really not gods but a result of men's imagination and superstition in trying to explain their existence. Perhaps some of the gods were a result of worshipping constellations or pieces of meteors. They made their likeness in stone, marble, wood, and metal. 8 colon 6 The knowledgeable Christian knows that there is only one God, the Father who made all things and that we are in Him, Colossians 3 verse 3. 
There is but one Lord Jesus Christ who made all things, and we have life because of him. 8 colon 7 weak meaning fearful. Some weaker brothers can have their conscience bother them, their conscience can be defiled, violated. So, they criticize the others who felt at liberty to eat the meat. This is often the case today, it is the weaker non-Pauline believers who think they are being spiritual when they abstain from certain things. These are the ones who are offended. This kind of separation is not due to spirituality, it is due to ignorance. Read Rom 14-15-3 In Romans 14 verse 23, Paul says that going against our conscience is sin. So let us define the word. Conscience, Noah Webster, 1828 Dictionary Internal or Self-Knowledge, or Judgment of Right and Wrong, or the Faculty, Power or Principle within us, which decides on the lawfulness or unlawfulness of our own actions and affections, and instantly approves or condemns them. 8 colon 8 What we eat or do not eat does not matter to God, Colossians 2 verses 20-23. We can eat disgusting things if we want to, what matters is if we have trusted in Christ. Paul clearly says that idols are not real, and that meat offered to idols could not hurt anyone. There is no demonic influence in that quality meat. 8 colon 9 Some believers do not have this knowledge. They do not realize that food is not sinful in itself. The Corinthian believer could go and get the meat at the temple shop and eat it without any problem. But what about their weaker brother? Were they concerned with how it will affect him? Paul says in 10.23, All things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. All things do not edify. 8.10 If someone sees you eating food at the temple, he might feel bold and imitate you, but later his conscience might convict him because he is weak in knowledge. There are many things that we should not do because of love for others. 8.11 Our knowledge and liberty can be dangerous to others and cause them to stumble or perish. What a tragedy if a believer were to defile their conscience or a lost sinner reject Christ because a selfish Christian wants to assert his rights and have his way without thinking how it may affect another person. Christ died for him, he sacrificed himself, and we should be able to make a small sacrifice and forego eating the temple food for our weak brother or sister in the faith. Those who do not understand God's grace for today and Paul's distinctive apostleship are the weaker brothers. 8.12 When we are responsible for a believer falling away from Christ, we are affecting Christ himself. Our liberty can wound another's conscience which is to sin against Christ. It is not a question of right or wrong, but how will it affect the weak brother? It is better to go without meat. We need to learn to do without, out of love for others. 8.13 Paul is saying, If my brother will offend God by copying me and sin against his conscience, then I will avoid eating those things. Paul said I would rather go without eating flesh as long as I live than to offend a brother. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 24 Paul has given the Corinthians guidelines to follow. If they had friends that would be stumbled by seeing them meet that prime piece of meat at the temple meat shop, then they should stop going there. The weaker brother principle applies in many areas in our lives, what we eat and drink, the movies or plays we watch, the books we read, the music we listen to, etc. However, since God said that his will is that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, 1 Tim 2 colon 4, then saving others and helping weak brethren to come to understand Paul's distinctive ministry to the heaven-bound body of Christ is the most important. The Lord Jesus Christ was patient with his disciples, and we must be patient with all who will listen to us because we used to be mixers in the past. The greatest need of the church today is to not only be biblical but also dispensational, or they will never understand the Bible. God cares about our conduct and how we treat others, especially those in the body, Gal. 610. God has called us to live on a higher plane above sin and self. As we will see in chapter 13, charity is what should motivate our Christian conduct, and moment by moment we must make wise, selfless decisions for His glory. 
We are told, Study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Tim 2.15 Time passed, Genesis to Acts, Israel fell in Acts 7, God interrupted prophecy, the nation is temporarily blinded. Rom 11.11.12.25 But now, Romans to Philemon, the mystery, the dispensation of grace began when Paul was saved in Acts 9. Ages to come, Hebrews to Revelation, God resumes his dealing with Israel. 8 colon 1 Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Paul is answering their questions regarding meat, food, offered to idols. While it is true that knowledge can puff us up, Paul does not mean that we should not do all we can to know God and what he says through his word. This is why he prays for the Ephesians and Colossians that they may have knowledge. F. 117, Colossians 1 verses 9 and 10. Paul's goal was knowledge of Jesus. Phil 3:10, 2 Cor. 10 colon 5. But knowledge must be balanced by charity, love in action, which builds up. How often does our flesh want to be exalted? All the time. Therefore, we must as Paul says, I die daily, 1531. It is not about me or us, it is about Christ. We must die to ourselves and live unto Christ. It is not I, but Christ, Gal. 220. We reverence the Godhead, are in awe of his word, and are grateful that he graciously gives us eternal life and not what we deserve. We must do all for the glory of God. Our motive should always be to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ and bless the body of Christ. It takes only one millisecond to go from walking in the spirit to living in the flesh that is why Paul says, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, 927. But in our zeal and liberty, we must be careful not to stumble the weaker brother. In the context, this knowledge is the understanding that eating meat offered to idols does not matter. What matters is what Christ has done, but we must not use. Our liberty to stumble someone whose conscience may think it is wrong to eat that meat. These chapters, 8 to 10, address the weaker brother principle found in Romans chapter 14 to 15 colon 3. I used to be a weaker brother before I learned how to rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Tim, 2.15. At that time, I did not eat my favorite part of my pizza, the sausage, because I was a mixer and thought the Jewish dietary laws somehow pertained to me. I mixed Peter and Paul, law and grace, the things that belong to Israel with those of the body of Christ because I thought that the church, the body of Christ, began in Acts 2. I had not yet learned that the body of Christ began in Acts 9. I did not know that there was more than one church in the Bible. I did not know that there was more than one church in the Bible. The church in the wilderness, Acts 7 verse 38, the Messianic Judaism church in Matthew 16 colon 16 dash 18, Psalm 22 verse 22, Heb 2.12 and then the body of Christ, F. 1 22, 23. In Acts 10 verse 15, God showed Peter that he was no longer making the distinction between clean and unclean animals or people, the clean represented the Jews and the unclean, the Gentiles. What happened? Why the change? Peter did not understand why until Paul told him in Acts 15 and Galatians 2. God has postponed his prophetic dealings with the nation of Israel because they rejected their Messiah for the third time in Acts 7 with the stoning of the Holy Ghost filled Stephen. Israel committed the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost and are in apostasy. 2. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. We can think we know something when we really just have a very limited concept of how things are, compared to God. For one thing, Paul had not received the full revelation of the mystery yet, 1 Cor. 13 12, and for another thing, every one of us must be careful not to fall into the temptation of wrong emotive, Gal. 6 colon 1 dash 5. 3 But if any man love God, the same is known of him. 
Loving God for what he has done is the knowledge that counts. God sees our hearts and knows those who belong to him. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. 2 Tim 2.19 The Bible says that the Lord knows us and has sealed us unto the day of redemption. F. 4.30 A sealed person is a saved person. We cannot tell who is saved by looking at them. So how can we know? By their testimony. By whom and what they say they are trusting in for their salvation. For as concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. There is but only one God. Since there is no power in an idol, the meat is not affected in any way. 5. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many, and lords many, there were many temples for the Greek gods in Corinth, like the temple of Apollos. These false gods were merely called gods, they were really not gods but a result of men's imagination and superstition in trying to explain their existence. Perhaps some of the gods were a result of worshipping constellations or pieces of meteors. They made their likeness in stone, marble, wood, and metal. 6. But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. The knowledgeable Christian knows that there is only one God, the Father who made all things, and that we are in him. Colossians 3 verse 3. There is but one Lord Jesus Christ who made all things, and we have life because of him. 7. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge, for some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Weak meaning becoming fearful. Some weaker brothers can have their conscience bother them, their conscience can be defiled. So, they criticize the others who felt at liberty to eat the meat. This is often the case today. It is the weaker non-Pauline believers who think they are being spiritual when they abstain from certain things. These are the ones who are offended. This kind of separation is not due to spirituality. It is due to ignorance. Read Rom 14-15-3. In Romans 14 verse 23, Paul says that going against our conscience is sin. So let us define the word. Conscience. Noah Webster, 1828 Dictionary. Internal or self-knowledge, or judgment of right and wrong, or the faculty, power or principle within us, which decides on the lawfulness or unlawfulness of our own actions and affections, and instantly approves or condemns them. 8. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither, if we eat, are we the better, neither, if we eat not, are we the worse. What we eat or do not eat does not matter to God. Colossians 2 verses 20 to 23. We can eat disgusting things if we want to. What matters is if we have trusted in Christ. Paul clearly says that idols are not real and that meat offered to idols could not hurt anyone. There is no demonic influence in that quality meat. 9. But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Some believers do not have this knowledge. They do not realize that food is not sinful in itself. The Corinthian believer could go and get the meat at the temple shop and eat it without any problem. But what about their weaker brother? Were they concerned with how it will affect him? Paul says in 1023, All things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. All things do not edify. 10. For if any man see thee which hast knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? If someone sees you eating food at the temple, he might feel bold and imitate you, but later his conscience might convict him because he is weak in knowledge. There are many things that we should not do because of love for others. 11. And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish, for whom Christ died. Our knowledge and liberty can be dangerous to others and cause them to stumble or perish. 
What a tragedy if a believer were to defile their conscience or a lost sinner reject Christ because a selfish Christian wants to assert his rights and have his way without thinking how it may affect another person. Christ died for him, he sacrificed himself, and we should be able to make a small sacrifice and forego eating the temple food for our weak brother or sister in the faith. Those who do not understand God's grace for today and Paul's distinctive apostleship are the weaker brothers. 12. But when ye sin so against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. When we are responsible for a believer falling away from Christ, we are affecting Christ himself. Our liberty can wound another's conscience which is to sin against Christ. It is not a question of right or wrong, but how will it affect the weak brother? It is better to go without meat. We need to learn to do without, out of love for others. 13. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Paul is saying, if my brother will offend God by copying me, by sinning against his conscience then I will avoid eating those things. Paul said I would rather go without eating flesh as long as I live than to offend a brother. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 24 Paul has given the Corinthians guidelines to follow. If they had friends that would be stumbled by seeing them eat that prime piece of meat at the temple meat shop, then they should stop going there. The weaker brother principle applies in many areas in our lives, what we eat and drink, the movies or plays we watch, the books we read, the music we listen to, etc. However, since God said that his will is that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, 1 Tim 2 colon 4, then saving others and helping weak brethren to come to understand Paul's distinctive ministry to the heaven-bound body of Christ is the most important. The Lord Jesus Christ was patient with his disciples, and we must be patient with all who will listen to us because we used to be mixers in the past. The greatest need of the church today is to not only be biblical but also dispensational, or they will never understand the Bible. God cares about our conduct and how we treat others, especially those in the body, Gal. 610. God has called us to live on a higher plane above sin and self. As we will see in chapter 13, charity is what should motivate our Christian conduct, and moment by moment we must make wise selfless decisions for His glory. Chapter 9 Paul defends his apostleship and grace-giving. 9,1-27 Paul uses himself as an example of helping weaker brothers, the Corinthians, by not insisting on his rights. What was the Corinthians' problem? Their sanctification. They were babes and needed to grow and become spiritually mature. Their letter helps us in our growth. In 8.13, Paul says, I am allowed to eat meat offered to idols. But if it offends someone and causes them to not trust in Christ or live for him, I will not eat it. Paul said that there is no problem with eating that meat as long as they do not offend the conscience of others in the process. This demonstrates that there are limitations to our liberty. This is the weaker brother principle. In chapter 9, Paul continues to demonstrate this principle using himself as an example. God cares about our conduct and how we treat others. God is a giver. The Father gave His Son. He spared not His Son, but delivered Him up for us all. Rom. 832. Christ gave Himself for us while we were sinners and enemies. Rom. 5 colon 8. 10. Likewise, we as stronger brothers are to give, serve. Grace gives. The greatest event of all time was Christ's death on the cross for sins and his resurrection. Christ had an earthly ministry to Israel through the twelve apostles, Rom. 15,8 But one year after the cross Christ began his ministry from heaven to build the body of Christ through his one apostle, Paul. Christ will fill the heaven and earth with two different groups of believers. It's important that we understand the difference between the prophetic program and the mystery program because otherwise we will not be able to function the way God wants us to. Some at Corinth were saying that Paul was not a legitimate apostle. 
Paul says, mine answer to them that do examine me is this. 9 colon 3, then he gives a long answer defending his unique apostleship. In the process, he lists several reasons why he had the right as an apostle to be supported by the church, but he did not assert that right. Paul uses himself as an example of a strong brother, but first he will vindicate his apostleship. Paul had to defend his apostleship many times because it was challenged in many places including Corinth. Paul had a distinctive apostleship in the dispensation of grace. Paul freely founded the church at Corinth by giving them the gospel, Acts 18 verses 1 to 18. Christ had told him that he had many at Corinth who he knew would believe the gospel, Acts 18 verses 8 to 11. Then Paul taught them sound doctrine to help them grow for more than a year and a half. He supported himself by making tents and did not ask for their support. Paul wants the Corinthians to grow by imitating him. 9 colon 1 Paul just asked four questions. Apostle means sent. Paul was an apostle. He had liberty. He had seen the Lord who sent him with a message to the Gentiles, Acts 9 verses 17 and 27, 26 colon 12 dash 18. In fact, Paul was the last one to see the Lord Jesus, 15 colon 8. One of the qualifications of an apostle is to be a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ, Acts 1 22. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me, John 13 verse 20. Paul says that Christ appointed him to be an apostle and personally taught him what he needed to know. Paul did not learn about his ministry from another man. The Lord Jesus Christ kept him separate from the twelve apostles on purpose, Gal. 1 colon 1, 11 to 20. To not believe Paul was whom Jesus Christ sent to the body of Christ is to deny what Christ is doing today. Paul was the first person into the body of Christ. He is the pattern for us to follow, 1 Tim. 1 16. Paul magnified his office of being the apostle of the Gentiles, Rom. 11.13. The Corinthian believers were evidence of his apostleship. 9.2 Paul says even if others do not consider him to be their apostle, there is no doubt that he is their apostle because the Corinthians are his proof. Paul reminded them where they came from and how they changed in 6.9-11. But Paul gave them the gospel knowing it had the power to save them, just like his encounter with Christ had saved him. Paul was undeserving of Christ's loving sacrifice, and so are we. Knowing this should make us willing to share the truth of the gospel with anyone, not just the people we are comfortable with. 9 colon 3 Paul will now begin a long answer to those who say that he is not an apostle like the twelve. Paul uses himself as an example for them to follow. He says that he did not assert his rights out of love for the Corinthians and because it could hinder the gospel. He did not want their money, even if it was right for them to support him, he wanted them. He wanted them to have eternal life by the power of the gospel of Christ. Now he wants them to grow up and be mature in their service to Christ. 9 colon 4 sure they had the power to eat and drink even things offered to idols. 9 colon 5 Paul and Barnabas could have married, but they chose to remain single for the sake of the gospel, so they would be free to serve. They did not use this power, authority, but curtailed their liberty. Peter, the other apostles, and the brothers of Christ, like James and Jude, all took their wives along when they preached. 9 colon 6 It is interesting that Paul mentions Barnabas instead of Apollos. Perhaps Barnabas had visited Corinth and that they knew him. Paul and his friends were entitled to their support, but supported themselves wherever they went, 2 Thess. 3 colon 8, 9. 9 colon 7 Paul uses the example of human custom to reimburse those who earn it, the soldier, the farmer, and the shepherd, PROV. 27 colon 18. No soldier supports himself but receives supplies and wages from the government. After all his hard work, the farmer has a right to the produce. The shepherd expects to get milk and meat from the flock. 
Likewise, ministers of spiritual things are entitled to compensation. 9.8-11 Paul is not saying this as a man. God says the same thing in the law. God says this about oxen for man's good, Deuteronomy. 25.4, 1 Tim. 5.18, God says that both he that plows, plants, and he that reaps should enjoy sharing in the harvest. Paul applies the analogy of reaping and sowing to spiritual things and material things, Gal. 6 colon 6 8 9 12 Paul had heard that the Corinthians were supporting other apostles and preachers. So, he asks, are we not more worthy of your support? Paul had a right to be supported for his work, but he did not exercise this right. He had not asked them for anything because he did not want to hinder the gospel. He supported himself by his tent-making trade. 9.13 Paul uses the example of the Old Testament priests having a part of the sacrifices and offerings to further drive home his point, perhaps for the sake of the Jews in the assembly. 9.14 God has ordered that those who have received a spiritual blessing should support those who bless them spiritually. Those who preach the gospel are to live by means of the gospel. We are to graciously support those who bless us spiritually. Many grace pastors today chose to support themselves like Paul. 9.15 Paul had not claimed his right to live off the gospel, and he is not telling the Corinthians this because he wants them to pay him anything. Paul says that he would rather die than have someone take away his reward. 9.16 Preaching the gospel is what Christ required Paul to do. Paul was compelled to preach it. He has no choice in the matter. He is under orders. Christ has given him a job to do, a ministry. Paul is the master builder of the body of Christ and the dispensation of the grace of God, 3.10. 9.17 If Paul carries out his assigned ministry willingly, he will get a reward, but he has no choice about the job Christ has given him. Paul is to dispense the gospel, the body of sound doctrine Christ has given for him to deal out. To dispense means to distribute, give out provide. A pharmacy dispenses medication, a vending machine dispenses drinks and snacks, a gas station dispenses gasoline. The word dispensation is found four times in the King James Bible, 1 Cor. 9.17 F. 1.10, 3.2, Colossians 1 verse 25. Guess which apostle is the only one to use this word? Yes, Paul. This is because we have to divide the truth to the body of Christ, God's heavenly people, from the rest of the Bible, God's earthly people. Paul says this in 2 Tim 2.15, In this present age, God is dispensing grace and peace. How did Paul open this letter? See 1 colon 3 and Gal. 1 colon 3, it is not just a nice greeting from Paul when he says grace and peace, it is what God is dispensing today. This dispensation that we are living in is holding back his wrath and fury. God is not angry with anybody because Christ died for our sins and paid the sin debt of all mankind. The Father's approval of his Son's payment was demonstrated by his resurrection. Death could not hold his sinless Son, Acts 2 verse 24. God is not imputing our sin to us now, 2 Cor. 519. It is not sin that sends a person to hell, but unbelief. To be saved we need to believe the gospel clearly stated in 1 Cor. 15 colon 3, 4. Without faith it is impossible to please God, Heb. 11 colon 6. 918 Paul says, I am compelled to preach the gospel and cannot do anything but preach it. So, what is my reward? I will have a reward if I preach it for free, without cost to anyone. If Paul received financial compensation, he could perhaps be tempted to abuse his authority and take a bribe. 919 Paul was free from the control of all men. He did not owe anyone anything. He was not on any man's payroll. Still, he made himself a servant to everyone so that he could win them to Christ. 9.20-22 Christ is Paul's authority, his master. He is under his law, Rom. 8.2, 1 
Christ's life is operating in him. Paul did not offend people. He set aside personal privileges out of love on purpose. Paul carefully used tact to make contact with people. Paul was born a Jew, so he used that to win the Jews, and Paul was a Roman citizen, so he used that to win the Gentiles. He was uniquely suited as the perfect apostle to the body of Christ made up of both Jews and Gentiles. He became all things to all people so that he might save some. He knew he would not win everyone to Christ, but he wanted to save as many as possible and help them to have sound doctrine. 923 Paul worked hard for the gospel's sake so that he could be a bodybuilder for Christ, building the body of Christ so that he could spend eternity with many. In contrast, Israel's program involves nation building. In Israel's program, the nation had to confess their sins as a nation. If we, the nation of Israel, confess our national sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us, the nation of Israel, our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1 verse 9 as commanded in Leviticus 26 colon 40-43. But we in the body of Christ, just thank God that for Christ's sake he has already paid and forgiven us of that sin, f. 432, 924 run to win. We do not work for our salvation, that is a gift given by the grace of God. But after we are saved, Christ motivates us to do the work he has prepared us for, f. 210, once we understand God's will. What is it? Yes, that is right, 1 Tim. 2 colon 4, then we are in a race to do as much as we can, as well as we can, for Christ and his people, the body of Christ. Be ambassadors reconcile others to God and share the mysteries. Paul encourages the Corinthians and us to run to win. Many runs in a race, but only one wins the price. But we can all participate in the spiritual race of giving out the word of God rightly divided. 925 The we is Paul, Barnabas, and the Corinthian believers. I believe our crown is a job with responsibility in heaven. Paul used an illustration from the Greek games familiar to the reader for the Isthmian games, similar to the Olympics, were held near Corinth. The contestants trained to be a master in their sport and is moderate in all things, not excessive. They had to discipline themselves and work hard to win a prize. Paul reminds the Corinthians again to focus on their eternal rewards, not the temporal. Temperate means moderate. Paul wisely paces himself so he can have quality fruit. God wants all believers to have something to show at the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Cor. 510, 9,26-27 Paul is not shadowboxing. Paul says, he lives his life on purpose, calculating out what is the best use of his time for Christ. Paul is out on the racetrack running so that he will get a reward. Just like an athlete, Paul wisely keeps himself disciplined and under control. He is careful to not do what he tells others not to do. Cast away means unapproved by God, disqualified of getting a reward. Paul did not want to lose his reward for faithful service. Salvation is a free gift, but God wants all of us to work for him in our various roles to receive a reward. We can teach the word of God to equip believers to be strong in sound doctrine so they can serve Christ and teach others. 2 Tim 2 colon 2 What has God motivated you to do for him and the body of Christ? 9.01 am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? Paul just asked four questions. Apostle means sent. Paul was an apostle. He had liberty. He had seen the Lord who sent him to the Gentiles with a message, Acts 9 verses 17 and 27, 26 colon 12 dash 18. In fact, Paul was the last one to see the Lord Jesus, 15 colon 8. One of the qualifications of an apostle is to be a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ, Acts 1 22. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. John 13 verse 20. 
Paul says that Christ appointed him to be an apostle and personally taught him what he needed to know. Paul did not learn about his ministry from another man. The Lord Jesus Christ kept him separate from the twelve apostles on purpose, Gal, 1 colon 1, 11 to 20. To not believe Paul was whom Jesus Christ sent to the body of Christ is to deny what Christ is doing today. Paul was the first person into the body of Christ. He is the pattern for us to follow, 1 Tim. 1 16, Paul magnified his office of being the apostle of the Gentiles, Rom. 11.13. The Corinthian believers were evidence of his apostleship. 2. If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Paul says even if others do not consider him to be their apostle, there is no doubt that he is their apostle because the Corinthians are his proof. Paul reminded them where they came from and how they changed in 6 9 11. But Paul gave them the gospel knowing it had the power to save them, just like his encounter with Christ had saved him. Paul was undeserving of Christ's loving sacrifice, and so are we. Knowing this should make us willing to share the truth of the gospel with anyone, not just the people we are comfortable with. 3. Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Paul will now begin a long answer to those who say that he is not an apostle like the twelve. Paul uses himself as an example for them to follow. He says that he did not assert his rights out of love for the Corinthians and because it could hinder the gospel. He did not want their money, even if it was right for them to support him, he wanted them. He wanted them to have eternal life by the power of the gospel of Christ. Now he wants them to grow up and be mature in their service to Christ. For have we not power to eat and to drink? Sure, they had the power to eat and drink even things offered to idols. 5. Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord, and Cephas? Paul and Barnabas could have married, but they chose to remain single for the sake of the gospel, so they would be free to serve. They did not use this power, authority, but curtailed their liberty. Peter, the other apostles, and the brothers of Christ, Matt. 1355, all took their wives along when they preached. Six were I only and Barnabas, have not we power to forbear working? It is interesting that Paul mentions Barnabas instead of Apollos. Perhaps Barnabas had visited Corinth and that they knew him. Paul and his friends were entitled to their support, but supported themselves wherever they went, to Thess. 3 colon 8, 9. 7 Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard, and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock, and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Paul uses the example of human custom to reimburse those who earn it, the soldier, the farmer, and the shepherd, PROV. 27 colon 18, no soldier supports himself but receives supplies and wages from the government. After all his hard work, the farmer has a right to the produce. The shepherd expects to get milk and meat from the flock. Likewise, ministers of spiritual things are entitled to compensation. 8 say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? Paul is not saying this as a man. God says the same thing in the law. 9 For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? God says this about oxen for man's good, Deuteronomy. 25 colon 4, 1 Tim. 5 18, dot. 10 or saith he it altogether for our sakes. For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. God says that both he that plows, plants, and he that reaps should enjoy sharing in the harvest. 11. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Paul applies the analogy of reaping and sowing to spiritual things and material things, Gal. 6 colon 6. 12. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? 
Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Paul had heard that the Corinthians were supporting other apostles and preachers. So, he asks, are we not more worthy of your support? Paul had a right to be supported for his work, but he did not exercise this right. He had not asked them for anything because he did not want to hinder the gospel. He supported himself by his tent-making trade. 13. Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Paul uses the example of the Old Testament priests having a part of the sacrifices and offerings to further drive home his point, perhaps for the sake of the Jews in the assembly. 14. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. God has ordered that those who have received a spiritual blessing should support those who bless them spiritually. Those who preach the gospel are to live by means of the gospel. We are to graciously support those who bless us spiritually. Many grace pastors today chose to support themselves like Paul. 15. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me, for it were better for me to die, than that any man should make my glorying void. Paul had not claimed his right to live off the gospel, and he is not telling the Corinthians this because he wants them to pay him anything. Paul says that he would rather die than have someone take away his reward. 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me, if I preach not the gospel. Preaching the gospel is what Christ required Paul to do. Paul was compelled to preach it. He has no choice in the matter. He is under orders. Christ has given him a job to do, a ministry. Paul is the master builder of the body of Christ and the dispensation of the grace of God. 310. 17. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward, but if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. If Paul carries out his assigned ministry willingly, he will get a reward, but he has no choice about the job Christ has given him. Paul is to dispense the gospel, the body of sound doctrine Christ has given for him to deal out. To dispense means to distribute, give out, provide. A pharmacy dispenses medication, a vending machine. Dispenses drinks and snacks, a gas station dispenses gasoline. The word dispensation is found four times in the King James Bible, 1 Cor, 917 F, 110, 3 2, Colossians 1 verse 25. Guess which apostle is the only one to use this word? Yes, Paul. This is because we have to divide the truth to the body of Christ, God's heavenly people, from the rest of the Bible, God's earthly people. Paul says this in 2 Tim 2.15, In this present age, God is dispensing grace and peace. How did Paul open this letter? See 1 colon 3 and Gal. 1 colon 3, It is not just a nice greeting from Paul when he says grace and peace, it is what God is dispensing today. This dispensation that we are living in is holding back his wrath and fury. God is not angry with anybody because Christ died for our sins and paid the sin debt of all mankind. The Father's approval of His Son's payment was demonstrated by His resurrection. Death could not hold His sinless Son. God is not imputing our sin to us now. 2 Cor 5.19 It is not sin that sends a person to hell, but unbelief. To be saved we need to believe the gospel clearly stated in 1 Cor. 15 colon 3, 4. Without faith it is impossible to please God, Heb. 11 colon 6. 18 What is my reward then? Verily that, when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. Paul says, I am commanded and compelled to preach the gospel and cannot do anything but preach it. So, what is my reward? I will have a reward if I preach it for free, without cost to anyone. If Paul received financial compensation, he could perhaps be tempted to abuse his authority and take a bribe. 19 For though I be free from all men, 
Yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Paul was free from the control of all men. He did not owe anyone anything. He was not on any man's payroll. Still he made himself a servant to everyone so that he could win them to Christ. 20 And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews, to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law, 21 To them that are without law, as without law, Gentiles, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, Christ is Paul's authority, his master. He is under his law, Rom. 8 colon 2 Christ's life is operating in him, that I might gain them that are without law. 22 To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak, I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Paul did not offend people, he set aside personal privileges out of love on purpose. Paul carefully used tact to make contact with people. Paul was born a Jew, so he used that to win the Jews, and Paul was a Roman citizen, so he used that to win the Gentiles. He was uniquely suited as the perfect apostle to the body of Christ made up of both Jews and Gentiles. He became all things to all people so that he might save some. He knew he would not win everyone to Christ. But he wanted to save as many as possible and help them to have sound doctrine. 23 And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Paul worked hard for the gospel's sake, so that he could be a bodybuilder for Christ, building the body of Christ so that he could spend eternity with many. In contrast, Israel's program involves nation building. In Israel's program, the nation had to confess their sins as a nation. If we, the nation of Israel, confess our national sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us, the nation of Israel, our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1 verse 9 as commanded in Leviticus 26 colon 40-42. But we in the body of Christ, just thank God that for Christ's sake he has already paid and forgiven us of that sin. 24 Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run, that ye may obtain. Run to win. We do not work for our salvation, that is a gift given by the grace of God. But after we are saved, Christ motivates us to do the work he has prepared us for. F. 210. Once we understand God's will. What is it? Yes, that is right. 1 Tim. 2 colon 4. Then we are in a race to do as much as we can, as well as we can, for Christ and his people, the body of Christ. Be ambassadors reconcile others to God and share the mysteries. Paul encourages the Corinthians and us to run to win. Many runs in a race, but only one wins the price. But we can all participate in the spiritual race of giving out the word of God rightly divided. 25 And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. The we is Paul, Barnabas, and the Corinthian believers. I believe our crown is a job with responsibility in heaven. Paul used an illustration from the Greek games familiar to the reader for the Isthmian games, similar to the Olympics, were held near Corinth. The contestants trained to be a master in their sport and is moderate in all things, not excessive. They had to discipline themselves and work hard to win a prize. Paul reminds the Corinthians again to focus on their eternal rewards, not the temporal. Temperate means moderate. Paul wisely paces himself so he can have quality fruit. God wants all believers to have something to show at the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Cor. 5 10. 26 I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so, fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Paul is not shadowboxing. Paul says, he lives his life on purpose, calculating out what is the best use of his time for Christ. 27 But I keep under my body, and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul is out on the racetrack running so that he will get a reward. Just like an athlete, Paul wisely keeps himself disciplined and under control. 
He is careful to not do what he tells others not to do. Castaway means unapproved by God, not getting a reward. Paul did not want to lose his reward for faithful service. Salvation is a free gift, but God wants all of us to work for him in our various roles to receive a reward. We can teach the word of God to equip believers to be strong in sound doctrine so they can serve Christ and teach others. 2 Tim 2 colon 2 What has God motivated you to do for him and the body of Christ? Chapter 10 Israel AS An example of what not to do 10 colon 1 dash 15 flee from the sins Israel fell into in the past. 10 colon 16 dash 11 colon 1 believers must be 100% separated unto God. No idol worship. Make sure there is not a hint of a desire in you to worship idols, the table of devils. We cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Paul finishes the weaker brother principle laid down in chapter 8. What does Paul mean by saying the rock that followed them was Christ? Who or what is the destroyer in verse 1010? What is the fall as mentioned in 1012? What are the temptations Paul is talking about in 1013? What or who is the one bread and the one body in 1017? What does God's word say about these things? The answers are underlined. In chapter 10 to 11 colon 1 Paul uses Israel as an example of what not to do as he finishes his instruction regarding meat offered to idols and how our liberty is limited as we are considerate to someone who is weaker in their faith. 10 colon 1 dash 4 Paul speaks as a Jew and uses Israel as an example of what not to do. There were many Jews in the church at Corinth since they had come over from the synagogue next door. They realized that God was now working with Paul. These had seen that God had given Paul and those in that assembly Israel's signs. Paul says he does not want them to be ignorant, unaware, that their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the twelve tribes were under Christ's care for their needs in the wilderness. This was during their exodus from Egyptian bondage on their way to the promised land. The Israelites were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, identified with Moses' group as they passed on dry ground through the Red Sea. There is no water in this baptism. Just like in Rom 6 3, for when we identify with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. They all ate the same spiritual food, manna, Exodus 16 verse 31, and drank of the spiritual rock that followed them. Water in the Bible is life. Paul, who was given further and more advanced information identifies and states that rock was Christ, Exodus 17 verses 5 and 6, number 20 colon 7-13, 27 colon 14. Almost every time the Bible uses the word rock or stone it is referring to Christ, Exodus 33 verse 22, Deuteronomy 32 colon 17, 18, Dan 234, PSA 118 colon 22, Matt 725, 1618, 2142 minus 46, 1 Peter 2 verses 5 to 10, Acts 4 verse 11 Both the church in the wilderness with Moses and the Messianic church Christ began with Christ as their rock. Christ said he would build the kingdom on earth church on Peter's confession of faith, Matt 16:16. 16, 16. In contrast, for us in the body of Christ, Jesus is the head of the body. The church in the wilderness, Acts 7 verse 38, and the kingdom church are the believers that will live in the earthly kingdom. Those who believed God from Adam to Abraham will also be resurrected to live in the earthly kingdom. But the body of Christ will live in the heavenly kingdom. 2 Tim 4.18 10 colon 5 But God was not pleased with many of them because of their unbelief, not only during their wanderings but also when they were about to conquer and enter the land of Canaan. The Israelites were overthrown in the wilderness, they were disqualified because of their lack of faith. They took part in the spiritual food and drink, but they still died. They had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years while that generation who had unbelief died. Number 14 26-33
The ten spies died immediately, number 14 colon 36 dash 38, but not Caleb and Joshua. 10 colon 6 God wrote this so that we could learn not to repeat Israel's poor choices. Their bad example is also repeated in the book of Hebrews as a bad example to those who will go through the tribulation, Heb. 3 colon 8, 17. We should learn from their mistakes and not lust after evil things as they did. Paul says neither four times so that believers should not follow any of Israel's bad examples. Covetousness is idolatry, Colossians 3 verse 5. Those people wanted things that were outside the will of God for them at that particular time. The mixed multitude were not satisfied with the manna and longed for the food in Egypt, the cucumbers, and the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away, there is nothing at all, beside this manna, before our eyes, number 11 colon 5, 6. 10 colon 7 Paul says do not be idolaters like the Israelites who rose up to play, Exodus 32 verse 6. They worshipped the golden calf, while Moses was up on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments from God. Who does the molten calf represent? Right, the once anointed cherub that once covered God's throne was Satan, 2 Chronicles. 11 15, Ezek. 28 colon 14, 1 10, 10 14, Revelation 4 verse 7. The adversary always wants to foil God's plan and counterfeit what he is doing. He was against Moses, against Christ and the little flock, and then against Paul. 10 colon 8 Paul now warns against fornication like they did when Balaam told the king of Moab to cause his people to fornicate with the Jews so that Israel would bow down to their gods. Therefore, 23,000 died in one day. Numbers 25 verse 9 says 24,000 because that is the total of the deaths since more died later. 10 colon 9 do not tempt God as the Israelites who spoke against his plan for them and what Moses was doing, saying, have you brought us to the wilderness to die? They were ungrateful for the miracle of manna saying, our soul loatheth this light bread, number 21 colon 5, 6. So, God sent fiery serpents to bite them so that they died. Therefore, Moses was commanded to make a brass serpent and put it on a pole so that anyone who was bitten who looked at it by faith, lived, number 21 9 10 10 Paul warns the Corinthians not to murmur or complain like Korah and those who joined with him, they murmured, and God sent a plague, the destroyer is Jesus, that killed about 15,000, number 16 36 50 God hates complaining. 1011 God did not like it when Israel murmured, so Paul warns believers not to murmur and complain. Then Paul reiterates that these things were written for our admonishing as warnings. We cannot fake it. God knows our hearts. They ate spiritual food and drink, but they suffered the second death in the lake of fire, the ends of the world, because of their lack of faith. 1012 All people have had similar temptations. Paul warns that believers should not be overconfident that they will not be tempted to fall into these sins. Once a person is saved, they cannot lose their salvation, but they can still sin and have a fruitless life without any rewards at Christ's judgment seat. 1013 God knows that we still have the sin nature in our flesh. But he who keeps us is faithful and will not allow us to be tempted to the point of falling from grace without giving us an opportunity to escape the temptation. God is faithful. God is very interested in us and what we say and do. God did physical signs for Israel such as parting the rivers, sending or not sending rain, winning their battles, etc. For the body of Christ, God gives us all the spiritual blessings up front, F. 1 colon 3, he is concerned with our spiritual growth, the edification of our soul and spirit. Christ lives in us. We are not to grieve his Holy Spirit with our poor conduct. God will give us the grace not to succumb to this list of sins that the nation of Israel did, unbelief, lust for evil things, idol worship, lewd behavior, fornication, speaking against Christ, murmuring.
One way we can live above sin and self is to renew ourselves in his word daily. Call 316 ROM 1017 12 colon 2 F 5 colon 25 dash 27. We can be tempted, but if we allow the mind of Christ 216 to reprogram our minds, we will think correctly like him. This is how it works. We read his word and understand it with our minds, spirit, then we believe what we have understood with our heart, soul, then his word is internalized by going from our mind to our heart by faith so it can work effectually in us, 1 Thess. 2.13 When we understand and believe his perfect word, KJV, rightly divided, we can function the way God intended us to and be useful to him. 10.14 Paul calls the Corinthians my dearly beloved and says flee from idolatry. Joseph is an example of someone that was able to flee from fornication. May I say that a bar is not a place for a former alcoholic, neither is the donut shop the place for someone determined to lose weight. Neither is the TV remote or social media the place for someone who wants to study the Bible. Idolatry is anything we value more than God. Flee from exalting anything above the Lord Jesus Christ. Without him we are nothing and have no hope. So, everything else crumbles. But with us in Christ and him in us we can be useful to God and others. One of the main ways to grow in faith is by studying the word, what does wrong. 10.17 say, by studying the Bible, we will learn to know God. If we study the Bible rightly divided, we will be able to be renewed in our minds and transformed to be like him, Rom. 12 colon 2. 10 15 Paul uses a little holy sarcasm when he says that he speaks as to wise men. Then he challenges them to judge that what he says is true. 10 16 Paul says that we bless and share in Christ's death, his blood and broken body. Separation to God is essential. Paul illustrates this as he contrasts the Lord's table and Satan's table to idols. Satan always makes a counterfeit of what God does. Paul says that devils are behind the food offered to idols. We already read that in Deuteronomy 32 colon 17, 18. Paul makes it clear that he has taught them to remember the Lord by drinking wine and eating bread with his sacrifice in mind. I know that this is a controversial subject even among grace believers, so I ask you to hear me out. Paul is referring to the wine, the cup of blessing as representing Christ's blood, and the bread his body that was broken for us. We will cover this more in chapter 11. The idea that the wine and bread really are Christ's blood and body, transubstantiation, as mentioned in the Catholic and Lutheran ceremonies, is totally false. Because Christ was speaking symbolically, John 6 verses 47 to 58. The body of Christ in this verse is Christ's physical body. 1017 in this verse the first one bread, being many, and one body are the members of the body of Christ, 1227, while the last one bread is Christ. How can we be certain that the first one bread does not include Peter and his group? Because in Galatians 6 verse 16 Paul makes a distinction between the two groups, also see Matt. 1928. Israel as a nation stumbled at the cross, then fell in Acts 7 at the stoning of Stephen. Peter and his group, the believing remnant, was given a one-year opportunity to preach to Israel to get them to believe on their Messiah. Christ pleaded with the Father to forgive them on the cross, Luke 23 verse 34, reducing their sentence from murder to manslaughter. Jesus Christ also pleaded with the Father to give the Jews one more year to believe, Luke 13 verses 6 to 9. When Stephen preaches, he essentially says your time is up. Peter and his group did not fully know that their program was interrupted, put on hold, closed to new recruits, and postponed until Paul told them in Acts 15 verses 1 to 29 and Gal. 2 colon 1 dash 10, during the diminishing, Rom. 11 11, 12, Paul went to the Jews scattered abroad to tell them that Jesus is the Christ, Rom. 10 colon 8, and if they want to be saved for them to believe the gospel he preaches, 1 Cor. 15 colon 3, 4. 
When did Paul know that Israel as a nation had fallen? When he heard Christ say, Delivering thee from the people, unbelieving Israel, Acts 26 verse 17. Paul knew that Israel had fallen on the very day that he was saved in Acts 9, but the Holy Spirit by the pen of Luke did not disclose that information until Acts 26. Christ sent Paul to the unbelieving Gentiles so they would now have an opportunity to be saved apart from Israel. The Gentiles could be saved apart from blessing Israel as commanded in Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3. We live in a new and different dispensation formerly kept secret. The dispensation of grace, the mystery, has been revealed through Paul, but Satan still wants to conceal it. 10.18-20 Israel after the flesh are those who were not spiritually circumcised by receiving the Holy Ghost like Peter's group. Paul said that the priests who sacrificed to God could eat what had been offered on the altar. Paul is not saying that an idol is anything, but that he does not want them to take part in Satan's counterfeit communion service, Leviticus. 17.7 PSA 115.4-8 there is no power in the idol, but the devil is behind them. Paul says to make sure that no part of you has any fellowship with devils by esteeming the idol rather than God. 1021, 22, we cannot worship both God and an idol. We cannot partake of both the Lord's table and the table of idols. God wants all of our worship. Do not make him jealous by spiritual adultery. He knows your heart, Deuteronomy. 32 colon 21. Christ said we cannot serve two masters, Matt. 624. Make sure no part of you cares about idols. We must separate ourselves 100% to God alone. 1023 Paul is under grace, not the law. He is free to do as he wants, but not everything is profitable to him or others. Our liberty is limited by love. 1024 Paul summarizes the weaker brother principle which has to do with what is best for others. When we seek to esteem others better than ourselves, we are showing love. Paul will say more about charity, God's kind of unconditional sacrificial love, in chapter 13. 10.25-27 Now Paul will give some very practical advice. Do not be overly picky and legalistic. Eat whatever you like in the food courts without asking where it came from. Eat, don't ask. Everything belongs to God, even the cow, and all food. If some unbelievers have you over for a meal, eat what they serve. There is no rule that we should not eat certain meat. But out of love for someone whose conscience is weak, we should not eat it. The test question is, will I glorify God by doing this? 1028, but if anyone says that the food was offered to idols, do not eat it for his weak conscience sake. Everyone does not know that God owns everything. So, you could wound his weak conscience by your knowledge and strong conscience in this matter. We may not want to serve our Jewish guests pork chops or bacon. 1029, 30, we are free to eat what we want and someone that does not know that should not judge us. Paul asked, why should someone speak evil of something I eat when I have thanked God for it? 1 Tim 4 colon 1 dash 6 Food is nothing, 8 colon 8 What Christ has done is everything. 1031 Whatever we do, we do it all for the glory to God. Colossians 3 verses 23 to 24 It glorifies God when we care about how our conduct may affect our weaker brother. It is better to go hungry than to cause a weaker brother to stumble. 1032 There were three kinds of people in the world at the time of this letter, lost Jews, lost Gentiles, and the Church of God, all believers both the body of Christ and the Israel of God that was dying out. So do not do anything to stumble any of them. Today there are two kinds of people saved and unsaved. Paul's ministry in Acts to the Jews ended in Acts 28 verse 28 when he stopped announcing to them that God had changed the program. 1033 Just like Paul seeks to please and profit all men, not himself, so should we. The goal is that more may be added to the body of Christ and come to understand what God is doing now. 
11 colon 1 then Paul says follow my example as I follow Christ. Christ cared more about others than his own life. Paul blessed and preached to the Corinthians for free. Our liberty is limited by love. Love should be the motive of our Christian conduct. We can clean the house, mow the lawn, or take out the trash to the best of our ability with responsibility and as unto the Lord whom we serve. We need to show love and respect to all. Humanly speaking, it may seem wrong for a stronger believer to bow to a weaker brother, but this is what pleases God. If we live to win souls for Christ, these questions about conduct will take care of themselves. 10 colon 1 Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, 2 and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, 3 and did all eat the same spiritual meat, 4 and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Paul speaks as a Jew and uses Israel as an example of what not to do. There were many Jews in the church at Corinth since they had come over from the synagogue next door. They realized that God was now working with Paul. These had seen that God had given Paul and those in that assembly Israel's signs. Paul says he does not want them to be ignorant, unaware that their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 tribes were under Christ's care for their needs in the wilderness. This was during their exodus from Egyptian bondage on their way to the promised land. The Israelites were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, identified with Moses' group as they passed on dry ground through the Red Sea. There is no water in this baptism. Just like in Rom 6 3, for when we identify with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, they all ate the same spiritual food, manna, Exodus 16 verse 31, and drank of the spiritual rock that followed them. Water in the Bible is life. Paul, who was given further and more advanced information identifies and states that rock was Christ, Exodus 17 verses 5 and 6, number 20 colon 7 dash 13, 27 colon 14. Almost every time the Bible uses the word rock or stone it is referring to Christ, Exodus 33 verse 22, Deuteronomy 32 colon 17, 18, Dan 234, PSA 118 colon 22, Matt 725, 1618, 2142 minus 46, 1 Peter 2 verses 5 to 10, Acts 4 verse 11 Both the church in the wilderness with Moses and the Messianic church Christ began with Christ as their rock. Christ said he would build the kingdom on earth church on Peter's confession of faith, Matt 16, 16. In contrast, for us in the body of Christ, Jesus is the head of the body. The church in the wilderness, Acts 7 verse 38, and the kingdom church are the believers that will live in the earthly kingdom. Those who believed God from Adam to Abraham will also be resurrected to live in the earthly kingdom, but the body of Christ will live in the heavenly kingdom, 2 Tim 4 18. 5 But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. But God was not pleased with many of them because of their unbelief, not only during their wanderings but also when they were about to conquer and enter the land of Canaan. The Israelites were overthrown in the wilderness, they were disqualified because of their lack of faith. They took part in the spiritual food and drink, but they still died. They had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years while that generation who had unbelief died. Number 14 26-33 The 10 spies died immediately. Number 14 36-38 Six now these things were our examples, to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. God wrote this so that we could learn not to repeat Israel's poor choices. Their bad example is also repeated in the book of Hebrews as a bad example to those who will go through the tribulation, Heb 3 colon 8, 17. We should learn from their mistakes and not lust after evil things as they did. 
Paul says neither four times so that believers should not follow any of Israel's bad examples. Covetousness is idolatry, Colossians 3 verse 5. Those people wanted things that were outside the will of God for them at that particular time. The mixed multitude were not satisfied with the manna and longed for the food in Egypt, the cucumbers, and the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away, there is nothing at all, beside this manna, before our eyes, number 11 colon 5, 6. 7 Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to play. Paul says neither four times that believers should not follow Israel's example. Paul says do not be idolaters like the Israelites who rose up to play, Exodus 32 verse 6. They worshipped the golden calf, while Moses was up on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments from God. Who does the molten calf represent? Right, the once anointed cherub that once covered God's throne, Satan, 2 Chronicles. 11 15, Ezek. 28 colon 14, 1 10, 10 14, Revelation 4 verse 7. The adversary always wants to foil God's plan and counterfeit what he is doing. He was against Moses, against Christ and the little flock, and then against Paul. 8 Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Paul now warns against fornication like they did when Balaam told the king of Moab to cause his people to fornicate with the Jews so that Israel would bow down to their gods. Therefore, 23,000 died in one day. Numbers 25 verse 9 says 24,000 because that is the total of the deaths since more died later. 9 Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Also do not tempt God as the Israelites who spoke against his plan for them and what Moses was doing, saying, Have you brought us to the wilderness to die? They were ungrateful for the miracle of manna saying, Our soul loatheth this light bread, number 21 colon 5, 6. So, God sent fiery serpents to bite them so that they died. Therefore, Moses was commanded to make a brass serpent and put it on a pole so that anyone who was bitten who looked at it by faith, lived, number 21 colon 7 dash 9. 10 neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Paul warns the Corinthians not to murmur or complain like Korah and those who joined with him, they murmured, and God sent a plague, the destroyer is Jesus, the judge, that killed about 15,000, number 16, 36-50. God hates complaining. 11. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. God did not like it when Israel murmured, so Paul warns believers not to murmur and complain. Then Paul reiterates that these things were written for our admonishing, as warnings. We cannot fake it. God knows our hearts. They ate spiritual food and drink, but they suffered the second death, the ends of the world, because of their lack of faith. 12. Wherefore let him that think he standeth take heed lest he fall. All people have had similar temptations. Paul warns that believers should not be overconfident that they will not be tempted to fall into these sins. Once a person is saved, they cannot lose their salvation, but they can still sin and have a fruitless life without any rewards at Christ's judgment seat. 13 There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. God knows that we still have the sin nature in our flesh. He who keeps us is faithful and will not allow us to be tempted to the point of falling from grace without giving us an opportunity to escape the temptation. God is faithful. God is very interested in us and what we say and do. God did physical signs for Israel such as parting the rivers, sending or not sending rain, winning their battles, etc. For the body of Christ, God gives us all the spiritual blessings up front. F. 1 colon 3, 
He is concerned with our spiritual growth, the edification of our soul and spirit. Christ lives in us. We are not to grieve his Holy Spirit with our poor conduct. God will give us the grace not to succumb to this list of sins that the nation of Israel did, unbelief, lust for evil things, idol worship, lewd behavior, fornication, speaking against Christ, murmuring. One way we can live above sin and self is to renew ourselves in his word daily, call 316, Rom, 1017, 12 colon 2, F, 5 colon 25 dash 27. We can be tempted, but if we allow the mind of Christ, 216, to reprogram our minds we will think correctly, like him. This is how it works, we read his word and understand it with our minds, spirit, then we believe what we have understood with our heart, soul, then his word is internalized by going from our mind to our heart by faith so it can work effectually in us, 1 Thess. 2.13, when we understand and believe his perfect word, KJV, rightly divided, we can function the way God intended us to and be useful to him. 14, wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Paul calls the Corinthians my dearly beloved and says flee from idolatry. Joseph is an example of someone that was able to flee from fornication. May I say that a bar is not a place for a former alcoholic, neither is the donut shop the place for someone determined to lose weight. Neither is the TV remote or social media the place for someone who wants to study the Bible. Idolatry is anything we value more than God. Flee from exalting anything above the Lord Jesus Christ. Without him we are nothing and have no hope. So, everything else crumbles. But with us in Christ and him in us we can be useful to God and others. One of the main ways to grow in faith is by studying the word, Rom. 1017 says, By studying the Bible, we will learn to know God. If we study the Bible rightly divided, we will be able to be renewed in our minds and transformed to be like him, Rom. 12 colon 2. 15 I speak as to wise men. Judge ye what I say. Paul uses a little holy sarcasm when he says that he speaks as to wise men. Then he challenges them to judge that what he says is true. 16 The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Paul says that we bless and share in Christ's death, his blood and broken body. Separation to God is essential. Paul illustrates this as he contrasts the Lord's table and Satan's table to idols. Satan always makes a counterfeit of what God does. Paul says that devils are behind the food offered to idols. We already read that in Deuteronomy 32 colon 17, 18. Paul makes it clear that he has taught them to remember the Lord by drinking wine and eating bread with his sacrifice in mind. I know that this is a controversial subject even among grace believers, so I ask you to hear me out. Paul is referring to the wine, the cup of blessing as representing Christ's blood, and the bread his body that was broken for us, we will cover this more in chapter 11. The idea that the wine and bread really are Christ's blood and body, transubstantiation, as mentioned in the Catholic and Lutheran ceremonies, is totally false. Because Christ was speaking symbolically, John 6 verses 47 to 58. The body of Christ in this verse is Christ's physical body. 17 For we being many are one bread, and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. In this verse the first one bread, being many, and one body are the members of the body of Christ, 1227, while the last one bread is Christ. How can we be certain that the first one bread does not include Peter and his group? Because in Galatians 6 verse 16 Paul makes a distinction between the two groups, also see Matt. 1928, Israel as a nation stumbled at the cross, then fell in Acts 7 at the stoning of Stephen. Peter and his group, the believing remnant, was given a one-year opportunity to preach to Israel to get them to believe on their Messiah. Christ pleaded with the Father to forgive them on the cross, Luke 23 verse 34, reducing their sentence from murder to manslaughter. 
Jesus Christ also pleaded with the Father to give the Jews one more year to believe, Luke 13 verses 6 to 9. When Stephen preaches, he essentially says your time is up. Peter and his group did not fully know that their program was interrupted, put on hold, closed to new recruits, and postponed until Paul told them in Acts 15 verses 1 to 29 and Gal. 2 colon 1 dash 10, during the diminishing, Rom. 11 11, 12, Paul went to the Jews scattered abroad to tell them that Jesus is the Christ, Rom. 10 colon 8, and if they want to be saved for them to believe the gospel he preaches, 1 Cor. 15 colon 3, 4. When did Paul know that Israel as a nation had fallen? When he heard Christ say, Delivering thee from the people, unbelieving Israel, Acts 26 verse 17. Paul knew that Israel had fallen on the very day that he was saved in Acts 9, but the Holy Spirit by the pen of Luke did not disclose that information until Acts 26. Christ sent Paul to the unbelieving Gentiles so they would now have an opportunity to be saved apart from Israel. The Gentiles could be saved apart from blessing Israel as commanded in Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3. We live in a new and different dispensation formerly kept secret. The dispensation of grace, the mystery, has been revealed through Paul, but Satan still wants to conceal it. 18 Behold Israel after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? 19 What say I then? That the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? 20 But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils, and not to God, and I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Israel after the flesh are those who were not spiritually circumcised by receiving the Holy Ghost like Peter's group. Paul said that the priests who sacrificed to God could eat what had been offered on the altar. Paul is not saying that an idol is anything, but that he does not want them to take part in Satan's counterfeit communion service, Leviticus. 17 colon 7, PSA. 115 colon 4 dash 8. There is no power in the idol, but the devil is behind them. Paul says to make sure that no part of you has any fellowship with devils by esteeming the idol rather than God. 21 Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord, and the cup of devils, ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table, and of the table of devils. 22 Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? We cannot worship both God and an idol. We cannot partake of both the Lord's table and the table of idols. God wants all of our worship. Do not make him jealous by spiritual adultery, he knows your heart. Deuteronomy 32 colon 21, Christ said we cannot serve two masters, Matt. 624, make sure no part of you cares about idols. We must separate ourselves 100% to God alone. 23 all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient, all things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Paul is under grace, not the law. He is free to do as he wants but not everything is profitable to him or others. Our liberty is limited by love. 24. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Paul summarizes the weaker brother principle which has to do with what is best for others. When we seek to esteem others better than ourselves, we are showing love. Paul will say more about charity, God's kind of unconditional sacrificial love, in chapter 13. 25 Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake, now Paul will give some very practical advice. Do not be overly picky and legalistic. Eat whatever you like in the food courts without asking where it came from, eat, don't ask, dot. 26 For the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. 27 If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. Everything belongs to God, even the cows, and all food, Exodus 9 verse 29. If some unbelievers have you over for a meal, eat what they serve. 
There is no rule that we should not eat certain meat, but out of love for someone whose conscience is weak, we should not eat it. At the Jerusalem Council, James asked the Gentiles that had turned to God to abstain from idols, fornication, and things strangled, and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day, Acts 15 verses 19 to 21, so the Gentiles could save the Jews into the body of Christ. 28. But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that shoot it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. But if anyone says that the food was offered to idols, do not eat it for his weak conscience sake. Everyone does not know that God owns everything. So, you could wound his weak conscience by your knowledge and strong conscience in this matter. We may not want to serve our Jewish guests pork chops or bacon. 29 Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other, for why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? We are free to eat what we want and someone that does not know that should not judge us. 30 For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that for which I give thanks? Paul asked, why should someone speak evil of something I eat when I have thanked God for it? 1 Tim 4 colon 1 6 Food is nothing. What Christ has done is everything. 31 Whether therefore ye eat, or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Whatever we do, we do it all for the glory to God. Colonel 3 colon 23 25 it glorifies God when we care about how our conduct may affect our weaker brother. It is better to go hungry than to cause a weaker brother to stumble. 32. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the Church of God. 33. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. There were three kinds of people in the world at the time of this letter, lost Jews, lost Gentiles, and the Church of God, Paul's group and Peter's group. Like Paul, do not offend others by the food you eat and serve, but seek to please and profit others, so more are saved. Today there are two kinds of people saved and unsaved. Chapter 11 Christian Order and the Lord's Supper 11 colon 2 16 Order in the Local Church at Corinth 11 colon 17 34 Disorder at the Lord's Table Supper, rebuked. What is the woman's covering? 11 colon 6. What does Paul mean by unworthily? Whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord, unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. In 1127, what does Paul mean by damnation in 1129? Does God chasten us in the dispensation of grace? 1132. Asterisk before we begin, I want to ask a question about the order of the books in the Bible as it relates to right division. It was given by Jesus for Paul to complete the scriptures, Colossians 1 verse 25. Paul's last book was 2 Timothy. So why did God not put Paul's letters last in the Bible? Because God wants us to know that after the rapture of the church, he will resume his dealings with Israel. Hebrews to Revelation are the books of the Bible that help the Hebrew believers and Gentiles who bless them to navigate through the tribulation and into the kingdom. I am so blessed because a lady in the UK recently told me that she had been praying that God would show her what the mystery was in the Bible. Somehow, she found out about my book on Amazon, God's Secret. After being a believer for 54 years, she has finally come to the knowledge of the truth, 1 Tim 2 colon 4 Paul has finished answering the question of eating meat offered to idols which include verses 8 colon 1 to 11 colon 1. Paul now wants to restore order and unity around the Lord's table and in the church. Apparently, some of the women in the church at Corinth were saying, since all things are lawful for me, therefore, I won't cover my head with a veil. I know that Paul does not use the word veil but I believe that it is implied. However, it may be that Paul is simply talking about women having long hair, not cut or shaved heads. Paul was disgusted with the Corinthians' abuse of the Lord's Supper. 
1 Corinthians is such a great letter to study because they were saved, yet their conduct was not right. The Corinthians were living and functioning as if they were still in Adam, still lost. Their conduct was similar to the world. They were not functioning on the basis of sound doctrine. How they treated each other was not reflecting their oneness in Christ. They had the wrong response to Paul's apostleship. Just like them, we need to answer the question, how can I live a life pleasing to God now? 11 colon 1 limit your liberty for the sake of another as Christ and I have done. To follow Paul is to follow Christ's heavenly ministry. Christ made Paul his minister to the body of Christ, Acts 26 verse 16, Rom 11 13, 15 16, F 3 colon 7, Colossians 1 verse 25. 11 colon 2 Paul wants to encourage the Corinthians to follow all the instructions he has given them. They should keep the ordinances as he delivered them. Paul then begins to talk about order in the church. Some women were praying in tongues too much, and some men were competing with others for a chance to speak. 11 colon 3 Paul lays down the chain of command among equals, Father God, Christ, man, woman, F. 523. Authority is for the sake of order, to eliminate confusion. There were too many chiefs and not enough Indians. We are to study to be quiet, 1 Thess. 411. The head gives direction and the final say. Be sure to respect the head. Every man is not the head of the woman. Paul will make it clear that the husband is the head of the wife. For the sake of order, in marriage, the wife should allow the husband to make the final decision. A wife is to respect her husband, F. 533. He, in turn, must be willing to die for her, F. 525. Christ said I and my father are one, John 10 verse 30, but he also said, my father is greater than I, John 14 verse 28. Christ voluntarily took a lower place while he was here on earth, philosophy. 2 colon 5 dash 7. As a woman submits to her husband, she practices submitting to her master, the Lord Jesus Christ. She gives him all the glory, for he alone is worthy, and we will praise his name forever. Paul will now apply the headship principle to wearing the customary veil in Corinth. 11 colon 4 praying is talking to God, while prophesying is speaking to the church for God. Prophesy also involves determining which letters are scripture and their order. There should be nothing between a man and his head, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is made in his image, he redeemed him, he is his authority. 11 colon 5 notice that Paul says that women were praying in the church and prophesying but needed to do so with a veil on their heads. These were gifts in that church for both men and women. It is interesting that all the 120 men and women in the upper room all received the Holy Ghost on Pentecost. Prostitutes in the immoral city of Corinth did not wear a veil announcing their availability for sinful pleasures. Therefore, to appear later like the women should wear veils in church. 11 colon 6 Although it is not customary in our country to wear veils, in some countries veils and shawls are considered modest apparel for women to show respect to their husbands. For both men and women ambassadors for Christ, what we wear and how we conduct ourselves should honor our ultimate head, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not to be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good, and acceptable, and perfect, will of God, Rom. 12 colon 2. Paul says that the woman should be modest and cover her head with a veil to distinguish herself from the prostitutes out of respect for her husband and the culture in Corinth. Many were the priestesses at the temple to Aphrodite. They were essentially prostitutes. They had shaven, bald, heads were shorn, short hair, and did not wear veils like the fine ladies. 11 colon 7 Moses covered his face with a veil so that the people of Israel would not discover that the glow of his face that he received when he spoke with God was fading away. Exodus 34 verses 33 to 35, 2 Cor. 3 colon 7. 
But when Moses spoke with God, his head was uncovered. Paul says men should not cover their heads. There should not be anything between a man and Christ. 11 colon 8, 9 The woman was made to be Adam's helpmeet, Genesis 2 verses 18 and 22. Both were made in God's image, Genesis 1 verse 27, 5 colon 1. The woman was made to complete the man, to make his life richer, fuller, and more exciting, to be his help meet, companion, and the other part of him. No man is complete without a woman except in special cases when God has given special grace to a man for a special work. Paul said this in 7 colon 7 and the Lord in Matt. 1912, apparently, some of the women in the church at Corinth were saying, since all things are lawful for me, therefore, I won't cover my head with a veil. Paul says that since the veil is a sign of submission to their husbands and to God, in the culture at Corinth, the women in the church should wear the veil. But Paul does not apply that custom to other churches, 1116. However, Paul does say elsewhere that women should dress modestly, 1 Tim. 2 colon 8 10, Holy Hands. Our hands ready to accept what God has said, not fighting against him with clenched fists. Peter also wants women to dress modestly, 1 Peter 3 verses 1 to 4. Peter also says that the husbands should treat the woman as the weaker vessel, like fine porcelain china, 1 Peter 3 verse 7. Women are weaker physically. But, as a mother of three and a retired nurse midwife, I am able to say that mothers need to be tough because childbearing is very painful, difficult work, requiring immense strength and stamina. Women should dress modestly yet be appealing. We can fix our hair and wear a little makeup occasionally. 1110 angels are another reason why women should wear a veil in Corinth. The angels are watching our conduct. They know if we honor our husband with our submissive, respectful behavior and by what we wear. 1111, 12 the woman was made from Adam's rib, Genesis 2 verse 22, but the woman gives birth to the man. The man needs the woman, and the woman needs the man. We both have strengths that we bring to the marriage. We are one flesh, one team. This is what our Lord said about marriage. See Matt. 19 colon 4 dash 6, 11 13 comely means handsome, beautiful, elegant. Paul does not think that it is laid alike for the woman not to keep the Corinthian custom of wearing a veil. A woman who is teaching a Bible class or praying should do so in modest dress and bring attention to the Lord and His Word, the Bible. 1114 Most male animals have short hair, with a few exceptions like the lion. Men should not look like women and vice versa. In Bible times, the Nazarite vow was an act of consecrating oneself to God. It was symbolized by long, uncut hair. This meant that the Nazarite was willing to bear shame for God's name. Even at that time, long hair on men was considered shameful. Because of this verse, I believe Jesus had short hair. Unfortunately, many paintings show him with long hair. In many ways, long hair on men is a sign of rebellion and is narcissistic. Think of Absalom, 2 Sam, 18 colon 9-14. 1115 Paul changes course a little because he does not want to impose veil wearing on all his churches. He now says that the woman's hair is her covering. Long hair is a glory to her, but we are free to wear our hair in any way that is becoming in this age. Because it is what Christ did for us that is important, not our hair length. For a while, I had to have short hair because my hair was breaking. I found out that the cause was the high protein diet that I was on. Protein breaks down to amino acids which need to be buffered by calcium carbonate, which the body robs from the hair and bones if there is a low carbohydrate intake. So, my hair and bones were more fragile on a high protein, low carb diet. Once I went on a high starch, low meat diet, my hair, nails, and bones all became stronger and longer. Remember, the woman who dried Jesus' feet with her hair? She was, in essence, saying, You are of more worth than the glory of my hair. It can wipe your feet. I glorify you above all else. 
Luke 7 verses 36 to 50. 1116 Some men may insist on having long hair. Paul concludes by saying that the church should not make rules in connection with the matter of women's dress or men's hair. Paul says that he is not giving one rule for all other churches to follow. 1117 Paul now rebukes the Corinthians for their abuse of the Lord's table. Paul says that the Corinthians were coming together for the worse, not the better. They had a meal that preceded the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, which is the same as the Lord's table. Paul only mentions the celebration of the Lord's Supper in this epistle, but how often does God have to tell us something before we obey? I hope you will say once. Still, we are under grace, not the law, and different churches celebrate the Lord's death in different ways. We are commanded to remember the day of Christ's death, not the day of his birth. We, of course, can individually remember the Lord's death every waking moment, but Paul is referring to a local church group activity. It is something the body of Christ should do together with gratitude because his death for our sins at Calvary is what we all have in common. His death and resurrection are what binds us together. We celebrate it because Christ accomplished our redemption. He was victorious in paying the costly price for our penalty after living a perfect life and dying a perfect death. It was his merit, love, and courage. Some churches celebrate it monthly and some quarterly. Some just share the meal and others just the bread and grape juice. Since the event took place during the week of unleavened bread, the juice was unfermented. It is called the fruit of the vine, never wine in the Gospels. Paul is concerned about order and unity. They should have come together out of love for each other. 11, 18, 19 he said they were eating in cliques, dividing themselves from one another. He had most likely heard this from Chloe's household. He said that those who do so commit heresies, while those who do not sit in cliques are approved. Heresies mean unsound doctrines or opinions. Remember when Peter and Barnabas withdrew from the Gentiles when certain men from James came and Paul withstood Peter to the face? He did it because Peter knew that God was not making a difference between Jews and Gentiles in the new dispensation he had begun. Peter's action built the middle wall of partition again, Gal 2:11-21. 328. By separating himself and eating only with the Jews, Peter was denying that the middle wall of partition was down. 1120, 21 When you come together you should be thinking that this is for the purpose of celebrating the Lord's Supper and having fellowship with others, not feeding yourselves. People were bringing their own food and not sharing it with those who were poor and hungry. Some were even drunk. They were in no condition to remember Christ or what he had done for them. 1122 What? Paul is appalled. Being drunk is a sin, Gal. 521 F. 518 If they were not going to share in a time of fellowship, they should have eaten at home. The fellowship was broken. Don't you have homes where you can eat before you come? Do you despise other believers and shame those who do not have as much money as you? Paul is furious and asks, Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Breaking bread together meant sharing, not every person having their own. 1123 Paul says that he delivered to them what the Lord Jesus personally told him. The same night that he was betrayed of Judas, at the end of the meal Jesus took bread and broke it and gave it to the twelve. Asterisk notice that Judas took part in this remembrance ceremony after Jesus had washed his and the other's feet, John 13 verses 10 to 12, 27, Luke 22 verses 19 to 22. 11, 24, the Lord had to drink the cup of God's wrath because of all mankind's sins. But for us, what the Lord did is a cup of blessing, 10, 16, because without his sacrifice, we have no hope. In giving instruction about the supper, Paul quotes the Lord. We should remember how he offered his body in our place. 2 Cor 5.21, 11.25 Now that the testator is dead, his will can be carried out. 
He was a perfectly satisfying sacrifice that the Father accepted on our behalf. 11 colon 26 28 As often as we eat the bread and drink the juice, we are celebrating his death till he comes in the air to catch us up. This was new information given to Paul. No one should eat or drink the cup unworthily with drunken, gluttonous, unruly behavior. A man should examine his own conduct in light of the word of God and consider what Christ has done for him. After that, he can drink the cup. Paul just wants them to be orderly. 1129 The word damnation here is not going to hell. It was not coming from God, but they were reaping the fruit of their own sinful conduct. Gal. 6 colon 7, 8. Christ has already died for the sins they are now committing. Unworthily. N. Adverb refers to their behavior, not them. They were drunk and gluttons at the Lord's Supper. It was unworthy, sinful conduct during the remembrance ceremony for Christ's death for their sins. The Corinthians had a problem with discernment because whoever eats the bread without reverence and gratitude does not understand the great sacrifice that the Lord Jesus Christ made on our behalf. He also does not show love to other members of the body of Christ. 11.30 The Corinthians were weak and sickly because of their lifestyle and needed to wake up to who they were in Christ and walk circumspectly. F. 5 colon 14 dash 21 11.31 If they would judge themselves, they would not need to be judged by someone else. We should judge our own conduct so that we do not have to be judged by others. 2.15, 5 colon 5 and Gal. 6 colon 1 However, Christ has paid for our sins, and we have his imputed righteousness. We are complete in him. Rom. 4.24, 25, 2 Cor. 5.21, Colossians 2 verse 10. We were unworthy, but he paid for us with his own blood. He redeemed us and justified us. Now we are worthy because we have Christ's righteousness imputed to us. It was Christ's merit, not our merit. God is not punishing people in the dispensation of grace. This is a time of amnesty when he offers grace, peace, and reconciliation. 1 colon 3, 2 core. 519, 1132 God does not chasten us according to the law today, but we are chastened by his word, by other people, or the conviction of the Holy Spirit. God also lets us suffer the consequences of our poor choices. In this case, God is using Paul's letter to chasten the Corinthians. Paul reproved them for the purpose of reforming them. It was a remedial instruction to correct their conduct. Believers are able to admonish each other. Rom 15:14, 2 Thess 3:15. In prophecy, the Lord used instruction to chasten His people. PSA 94:12, and physical punishment like no rain. Leviticus 26:19. Once a person is saved, they cannot lose their salvation. Rom. 8 colon 32 dash 39 1133 Paul says that when they come together to commemorate Christ's death, they should wait to eat until everyone has the bread and juice or food before eating. 1134 Their conduct is bringing condemnation on themselves. If they are too hungry to wait to eat, then they should eat at home before they act like drunk, selfish, gluttons, condemnation. They were out of order in many ways. There are other things Paul will set in order when he comes. Paul tells Timothy how to instruct those who oppose themselves to Tim. 2 colon 24 dash 26. We must be gentle, patient, and apt to teach. Paul never questions the Corinthians' salvation, only their conduct. They often behaved the way they did before they were saved. The Corinthians thought that all things were lawful for them. Paul tells them to be polite and gracious and to wait to eat. They should have some regard for the other saints. The word of God should be used to help others. What was the Corinthians' problem? Their sanctification. They were living below their identity as Christians. 
They were guilty of conduct unbecoming of a saint. They were carnal and babes. Their conduct did not match their identity in Christ, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Romans 8 verse 7 Carnal believers are dead while they are living. She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. 1 Tim 5 colon 6 For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. Romans 8 verse 13 We must wake up from this death. Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Ephesians 5 verse 14 Christ will invigorate us with his word rightly divided. Grace teaches us how we should live, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Titus 2 verse 12 To conclude, I personally believe that the Lord's Supper should be practiced, perhaps at the end of a fellowship meal. Because of what Christ has done, there are no believers who are unworthy of partaking in the Lord's Supper. Rom. 324, 5 colon 1. But, as Paul said, we should do it in a worthy manner. Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Michigan has YouTube studies and notes that were helpful to me in preparing this lesson. Were the Corinthians sinning in their observance of the Lord's Supper? Yes. What does the Supper commemorate? Christ's death for our sins. Paul had to rebuke the Corinthians because they had failed to judge this matter for themselves. 11 1b followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Limit your liberty for the sake of another as Christ and I have done. To follow Paul is to follow Christ's. Heavenly Ministry Christ made Paul his minister to the body of Christ, Acts 26 verse 16, Rom, 11 13, 15 16, F, 3 colon 7, Colossians 1 verse 25, dot. 2 Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances, as I delivered them to you. Paul encourages the Corinthians to follow instructions he has given them. They should keep the ordinances as he delivered them. Paul then begins to talk about order in the church. Some women were praying in tongues too much, and some men were competing with others for a chance to speak. 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Paul lays down the chain of command among equals Father God, Christ, man, woman, F. 523. Authority is for the sake of order, to eliminate confusion. There were too many chiefs and not enough Indians. We are to study to be quiet, 1 Thess. 411. The head gives. Direction and the final say. Be sure to respect the head. Every man is not the head of the woman. Paul will make it clear that the husband is the head of the wife. For the sake of order, in marriage, the wife should allow the husband to make the final decision. A wife is to respect her husband, F. 533. He, in turn, must be willing to die for her, F. 525. Christ said I and my father are one, John 10 verse 30, but he also said, my father is greater than I, John 14 verse 28. Christ voluntarily took a lower place while he was here on earth, philosophy. 2 colon 5 7. As a woman submits to her husband, she practices submitting to her master, the Lord Jesus Christ. She gives him all the glory, for he alone is worthy, and we will praise his name forever. Paul will now apply the headship principle to wearing the customary veil in Corinth. For every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. 5. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, husband, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. Notice that Paul says that women were praying in the church and prophesying but needed to do so with a veil on their heads. These were gifts in that church for both men and women. 
It is interesting that all the 120 men and women in the upper room all received the Holy Ghost on Pentecost. Prostitutes in the immoral city of Corinth did not wear a veil announcing their availability for sinful pleasures. Therefore, to appear later like the women should wear veils in church. 6. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn, but if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Veil. Although it is not customary in our country to wear veils, in some countries veils and shawls are considered modest apparel for women to show respect to their husbands. For both men and women ambassadors for Christ, what we wear and how we conduct ourselves should honor our ultimate head, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Rom 12 colon 2. Paul says that the woman should be modest and cover her head with a veil to distinguish herself from the prostitutes out of respect for her husband and the culture in Corinth. Many were the priestesses at the temple to Aphrodite. They were essentially prostitutes. They had shaven, bald, heads were shorn, short hair, and did not wear veils like the fine ladies. 7. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Moses covered his face with a veil so that the people of Israel would not discover that the glow of his face that he received when he spoke with God was fading away. Exodus 34 verses 33 to 35, 2 Cor. 3 colon 7. But when Moses spoke with God, his head was uncovered. Paul says men should not cover their heads. There should not be anything between a man and Christ. 8 For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. 9 Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. The woman was made to be Adam's helpmeet, Genesis 2 verses 18 and 22. Both were made in God's image, Genesis 1 verse 27, 5 colon 1. The woman was made to complete the man, to make his life richer, fuller, and more exciting, to be his help meet, companion, and the other part of him. No man is complete without a woman except in special cases when God has given special grace to a man for a special work. Paul said this in 7 colon 7 and the Lord in Matt. 1912. Apparently, some of the women in the church at Corinth were saying, since all things are lawful for me, therefore, I won't cover my head with a veil. Paul says that since the veil is a sign of submission to their husbands and to God, in the culture at Corinth, the women in the church should wear the veil. But Paul does not apply that custom to other churches. 1116. However, Paul does say elsewhere that women should dress modestly, 1 Tim. 2 colon 8 10. Holy hands are hands ready to accept what God has said, not fighting against him with clenched fists. Peter also wants women to dress modestly, 1 Peter 3 verses 1 to 4. Peter also says that the husbands should treat the woman as the weaker vessel, like fine porcelain china, 1 Peter 3 verse 7. Women are weaker physically. But, as a mother of three and a retired nurse midwife, I am able to say that mothers have to be tough because childbearing is very painful, difficult work, requiring immense strength and stamina. Women should dress modestly yet be appealing. We can fix our hair and wear a little makeup occasionally. 10. For this cause ought the woman to have power, authority, on her head because of the angels. Angels are another reason why women should wear a veil in Corinth. The angels are watching our conduct. They know if we honor our husband with our submissive respectful behavior and by what we wear. 11. Nevertheless neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man, in the Lord. 12. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. The woman was made from Adam's rib, Genesis 2 verse 22, but the woman gives birth to the man. The man needs the woman, and the woman needs the man. We both have strengths that we bring to the marriage. We are one flesh, one team. This is what our Lord said about marriage, Matt. 
19 colon 4 6. 13 Judge in yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Unveiled. Comely means handsome, beautiful, elegant. Paul does not think that it is laid alike for the woman not to keep the Corinthian custom of wearing a veil. A woman who is teaching a Bible class or praying should do so in modest dress and bring attention to the Lord and His Word, the Bible. 14 Doth not even nature itself teach you that, if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? Most male. Animals have short hair, with a few exceptions like the lion. Men should not look like women and vice versa. In Bible times, the Nazarite vow was an act of consecrating oneself to God. It was symbolized by long, uncut hair. This meant that the Nazarite was willing to bear shame for God's name. Even at that time, long hair on men was considered shameful. Because of this verse, I believe Jesus had short hair. Unfortunately, many paintings show him with long hair. In many ways, long hair on men is a sign of rebellion and is narcissistic. Think of Absalom, 2 Sam, 18 colon 9 dash 14, dot 15. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Paul changes course a little because he does not want to impose veil wearing on all his churches. He now says that the woman's hair is her covering. Long hair is a glory to her, but we are free to wear our hair in any way that is becoming in this age. Because it is what Christ did for us that is important, not our hair length. For a while, I had to have short hair because my hair was breaking. I found out that the cause was the high protein diet that I was on. Protein breaks down to amino acids which need to be buffered by calcium carbonate, which the body robs from the hair and bones if there is a low carbohydrate intake. So, my hair and bones were more fragile on a high-protein, low-carb diet. Once I went on a high-starch, low-meat diet, my hair, nails, and bones all became stronger and longer. Remember, the woman who dried Jesus' feet with her hair? She was, in essence, saying, You are of more worth than the glory of my hair, it can wipe your feet, I glorify you above all else. Luke 7 verses 36 to 50. 16 But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Some men may insist on having long hair. Paul concludes by saying that the church should not make rules in connection with the matter of women's dress or men's hair. Paul says that he is not giving one rule for all other churches to follow. 17 Now in this that I declare unto you I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. Paul now rebukes the Corinthians for their abuse of the Lord's table. Paul says that the Corinthians were coming together for the worse, not the better. They had a meal that preceded the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, which is the same as the Lord's table. Paul only mentions the celebration of the Lord's Supper in this epistle, but how often does God have to tell us something before we obey? I hope you will say once. Still, we are under grace, not the law, and different churches celebrate the Lord's death in different ways. We are commanded to remember the day of Christ's death, not the day of his birth. We, of course, can individually remember the Lord's death every waking moment, but Paul is referring to a local church group activity. It is something the body of Christ should do together with gratitude because his death for our sins at Calvary is what we all have in common. His death and resurrection are what binds us together. We celebrate it because Christ accomplished our redemption. He was victorious in paying the costly price for our penalty after living a perfect life and dying a perfect death. It was his merit, love, and courage. Some churches celebrate it monthly and some quarterly. Some just share the meal, and others just the bread and grape juice. Since the event took place during the week of unleavened bread, the juice was unfermented. It is called the fruit of the vine, never wine in the Gospels. Paul is concerned about order and unity. They should have come together out of love for each other.
18, for first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. 19, for there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. He said they were eating in cliques, dividing themselves from one another. He had most likely heard this from Chloe's household. He said that those who do so commit heresies, while those who do not sit in cliques are approved. Heresies mean unsound doctrines or opinions. Remember when Peter and Barnabas withdrew from the Gentiles when certain men from James came and Paul withstood Peter to the face? He did it because Peter knew that God was not making a difference between Jews and Gentiles in the new dispensation he had begun. Peter's action built the middle wall of partition again, Gal. 2 colon 11 21 3 28. By separating himself and eating only with the Jews, Peter was denying that the middle wall of partition was down. 20 When ye come together therefore into one place, this is not to eat at the Lord's Supper. 21 For in eating everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. When you come together you should be thinking that this is for the purpose of celebrating the Lord's Supper and having fellowship with others, not feeding yourselves. People were bringing their own food and not sharing it with those who were poor and hungry. Some were even drunk. They were in no condition to remember Christ or the body of Christ. 22 What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. What? Paul is appalled. Being drunk is a sin, Gal. 521 F. 518. If they were not going to share in a time of fellowship, they should have eaten at home. The fellowship was broken. Don't you have homes where you can eat before you come? Do you despise other believers and shame those who do not have as much money as you? Furious Paul asks, Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Breaking bread together meant sharing, not every person having their own. The Lord's Supper was a physical picture of what Christ had done for them. 23 For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. Paul says that he delivered to them what the Lord Jesus personally told him. The same night that he was betrayed of Judas, at the end of the meal Jesus took bread and broke it and gave it to the twelve. Asterisk notice that Judas took part in this remembrance ceremony after Jesus had washed his and the other's feet. John 13 verses 10 to 12, 27, Luke 22 colon 19, 22, dot. 24, and when he had given thanks, he break it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. The Lord had to drink the cup of God's wrath because of all mankind's sins. But, for us what the Lord did is a cup of blessing, 1016, because without his sacrifice we have no hope. In giving instruction about the supper, Paul quotes the Lord. We should remember how he offered his body in our place, 2 Cor. 5 21. 25 After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye, as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. Now that the testator is dead, his will can be carried out. He was a perfectly satisfying sacrifice that the Father accepted on our behalf. 26 For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do shew the Lord's death till he come. As often as we eat the bread and drink the juice, we are celebrating his death till he comes in the air to catch us up. This was new information given to Paul. 27 Wherefore whosoever shall eat this bread, and drink this cup of the Lord, unworthily, their unworthy conduct, drunk and not reverent, was denying what the bread and cup represent, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. No one should eat or drink the cup unworthily with drunken, gluttonous, unruly behavior. 28 But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread, and drink of that cup. 
A man should examine his own conduct in light of the word of God and consider what Christ has done for him. He should be sure to see the picture of Christ's suffering for him in the broken bread and blood red juice and behave right. After that, he can drink the cup. 29 For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. The word damnation here is not going to hell, it was being judged wrong and reaping the fruit of their own sinful conduct. Gal. 6 colon 7, 8 Christ has already died for the sins they are now committing. Unworthily, an adverb, refers to their behavior, not them. They were drunk and gluttons at the Lord's Supper. It was unworthy, sinful conduct during the remembrance ceremony for Christ's death for their sins, not discerning the Lord's body. The Corinthians had a problem with discernment because whoever eats the bread without reverence and gratitude does not understand the great sacrifice that the Lord Jesus Christ made on our behalf. He also does not show love to the Lord's body, the body of Christ, the one bread, and one body, 1017. 30 For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. The Corinthians were spiritually and physically weak and sickly because of their lifestyle, and needed to wake up to who they were in Christ and walk circumspectly. F. 5 colon 14 16. 31 For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. When we do wrong, we should judge or correct ourselves. If they would judge themselves to be wrong, then they would not need to be judged by someone else. Paul, we should judge our own conduct so that we do not have to be judged by others. 215, 5, and Gal. 6, 1. They should have been able to judge the fornicator in 5, 5. Paul is speaking of them correcting their own behavior and the behavior of others. He is not talking about their standing, but their state, conduct. Their standing is that we are complete in him, Colossians 2 verse 10, but they should behave like the saints they are. 32 But when we are judged, we are chastened, of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. God does not chasten us according to the law today, but he cares about their conduct. We are chastened, judged, or corrected by his word, by other people, or the conviction of the Holy Spirit. God also lets us suffer the consequences of our poor choices. In this case, God is using Paul's letter to chasten the Corinthians. Paul reproved them for the purpose of reforming them. It was a remedial instruction to correct their conduct. Believers are able to admonish each other. Rom 15.14 2 Thess 3.15 Paul said, All scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, 2 Tim 3 16, 17. 33 Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. Paul says that when they come together to commemorate Christ's death, they should wait to eat until everyone has the bread and juice or food before eating. 34 And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. Their conduct is bringing condemnation on them. If they are too hungry to wait to eat, then they should eat at home before they act like drunk, selfish, gluttons, condemnation. They were out of order in many ways. There are other things Paul will set in order when he comes. Paul tells Timothy how to instruct those who oppose themselves, 2 Tim, 2 24-26. We must be gentle, patient, and apt to teach. Paul never questions the Corinthians' salvation, only their conduct. They often behaved the way they did before they were saved. The Corinthians thought that all things were lawful for them. Paul tells them to be polite and gracious and to wait to eat. They should have some regard for the other saints. The word of God should be used to help others. What was the Corinthians' problem? Their sanctification. They were living below their identity as Christians. 
They were guilty of conduct unbecoming of a saint. They were carnal and babes. Their conduct did not match their identity in Christ, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Romans 8 verse 7 Carnal believers are dead while they are living. She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. 1 Tim 5 colon 6 Or if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. Romans 8 verse 13 We must wake up from this death. Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Ephesians 5 verse 14 Christ will invigorate us with his word rightly divided. Grace teaches us how we should live, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Titus 2 verse 12 To conclude, I personally believe that the Lord's Supper should be practiced, perhaps at the end of a fellowship meal. Because of what Christ has done, there are no believers who are unworthy of partaking in the Lord's Supper. Rom. 324, 5 1. But, as Paul said, we should do it in a worthy manner. Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Michigan has YouTube studies and notes that were helpful to me in preparing this lesson. Were the Corinthians sinning in their observance of the Lord's Supper? Yes. What does the Supper commemorate? Christ's death for our sins. Paul had to rebuke the Corinthians because they had failed to judge this matter for themselves. Being drunk is a sin, Gal. 521 F. 518. Gluttony is also a sin, Proverbs 23 verse 21. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. In chapter 11, Paul told the Corinthians that they were disgracing the Lord's Supper. Weeping, she began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Luke 7 verse 38. This is the end of part three.